Wayne Larrabee, Steve Stone at Chase Stadium. It has turned to hazy sunshine and very humid. A summer-like setting for this ball game here this afternoon. And here is Jim Riggleman's uh, batting order for the Chicago Cubs. No changes from last night. McRae, Sandberg, and Gray. Sosa, Gonzalez, Service. Gomez, Sanchez, and Foster. For the Mets, uh, defensively, Gilkey, Johnson, and Husky left to right in the outfield. Kent, Ordonez, Vizcaino, and Bronia left to right in the infield. And the battery of Pete Harnish and Todd Hundley. There is Brian McCray getting set to lead off for the Chicago Cubs. They honor John Franco here today uh, before the game in ceremonies here at Chase Stadium. Uh, he reached the 300 save plateau earlier this season, becoming the first left-hander in baseball history to save 300 games. Mets owners uh, Fred Wilpon and Nelson Doubleday presented John with a trophy. In addition, the club will make a $3,000 contribution to John's name to the society, uh, in John's name to the Society for Siemens Children, a Staten Island organization which cares for over 4,000 children yearly. There's the group of arbiters, and they'll be meeting with Jim Riggleman, the manager of the Cubs, and Bobby Wine, one of the coaches of the New York Mets. Greg Bonet behind home plate this afternoon. Larry Poncino at first, and Frank Pulley at second. Bob Davidson at third base. Now, normally, it isn't easy to face a club twice in a week. But last night, we saw that it didn't hurt Frank Castillo or Bobby Jones at all. But once again, another matchup that has seen the other club in less than a week. And that's Pete Harnish against Kevin Foster. Harnish, in a no decision, which the Mets eventually lost 5-4, to four, went six innings, giving up six hits on four earned runs. He didn't walk anybody, and he fanned four. He showed the Cubs a pretty good straight change, something that they'll have to look for today. And the key to the performance will be McCray and Sandberg at the top of the order. If they can get on, and we saw how devastating the one-two punch can be in the series against Montreal with Grezelanek and Lansing getting on at will, Montreal dominated the series. If McCray and Sandberg can get on at the top, it'll make things a lot easier for Grace, Sosa, and Gonzalez to improve upon their RBI total. The Mets dug out and again uh, was a little bit late in getting underway here this afternoon because of the pregame ceremonies, but... It has turned out, Steve, to be a beautiful day, uh, albeit a little humid, and we had expected some bad weather in the New York area. We may still get a lot of rain here, but it looks like it's going to be uh, late afternoon rather than early afternoon, and hopefully we'll be able to get this game in uh, without an interruption. Well, right now it's beautiful. It's some of the warmest temperatures they've seen in New York, certainly for baseball this year. And there's a look at Pete Harnish. Harnish started his career with the Baltimore Orioles. And then he was traded to the Houston Astros in what became known as one of the worst trades in Baltimore history. Glenn Davis going to Baltimore and Pete Harnish, Kurt Schilling, and Steve Finley all traded to San Diego. Later, Harnish was acquired by the Mets. Here's Dallas Green, former general manager of the Cubs. Harnish acquired from Houston for two players to be named later. Back in November 28, 1994. And again, uh, Steve, I mentioned it last week, uh, he gives this ball club at least some veteran leadership out of the field in, in terms of starting pitching. Uh, this club is dominated by young starters who are learning the trade. And a guy like Pete Harnish, who's been around, a veteran, knows the ropes, uh, he can certainly uh, lend a lot more than just innings pitched and victories to a pitching staff. Now, Pete is also a testament to the modern surgical technique because last year on August 18th, he underwent season-ending surgery to repair torn labrum in his right shoulder. Now, in years past, that would be an injury that certainly would have taken a foot off most anybody's fastball. But Harnish's fastball is back around 90 miles an hour, and he's throwing the ball particularly well. His record this year, 2-2, two and two, but the ERA up there at 497. And he's given up just one more hit than innings pitch. The control has been pretty good, just five walks in 29 innings. He has yet to complete a game of his five starts. And the Mets, who come in with a reputation of being a very spotty defensive team, have not shown that aspect of their game to the Cubs. Jeff Kent has been brilliant at third base. Shades of Brooke Rob Brooks Robinson or Ken Caminiti. This looked to be the weak spot in the infield after shifting Kent from second to third. But it hasn't turned out that way against the Cubs because despite his nine errors this year, 
in the four games that they have played against the Cubs, Jeff Kent has looked as good as any third baseman the Cubs have played against. Most of the action in the National League under the lights. Uh, Los Angeles and St. Louis will be getting underway at a little over an hour in St. Louis. In the American League, just a few day games. Boston trailing Toronto two to one that game in the top of the second inning. Baltimore Milwaukee will play today as will Minnesota and Oakland. Now I keep thinking that somebody sometime somewhere in the lineup and I don't know when is going to try to bunt on Jeff Kent. We've seen him make some good quick moves to either side but that's not the real test of a third baseman because most of the guys down there have good reflexes. What we haven't seen is Jeff Kent come in on a bunt have to barehand it and throw off balance to first base. So maybe today we'll see somebody test him and let's hope it's early in the ball game. Brian McCray steps in at 306 couple of homers 16 runs batted in. Brian last night 0 for 3 he was intentionally walked in the eighth inning. Pete Hardish the big right hander on the mound for the New York Mets and here's the first pitch of the ball game. Fastball for a strike call. Arnish at six feet, 207 pounds. One ball and one strike. Game time temperature, 79 sunny degrees. And the wind, once again, not much of a factor here today. The 1 1 delivery to McCray, and he hits a fly ball deep to right center field. On the run, Lance Johnson, it's over his head, one hop and to the wall. Brian McCray trots into second with a stand up double to lead off the ball game. Well, it looked to me like Brian might have wound up at third base had he accelerated around second. But I think Brian thought this ball was going to bounce out of the ballpark. And when it stayed in, McCray had already pulled up. So instead of a starting triple, it's a double. McCray crushes this one. Harness throws a lot of high fastballs, meaning that he's going to give up a lot of fly balls. No chance at all for Johnson. It hits high off the wall, stays in. And you see Brian just shutting it down before he got to second base even though the ball gets back over the head of Johnson. That's an easy triple. Ryan Sandberg steps to the plate with a runner in scoring position and takes a pitch up high for ball one. Rhino at 189 now with seven homers and 16 runs batted in. We mentioned he has left 12 men on base on this road trip alone. And he's got a chance to pick up the first run of the game out at second base right now. McCray a quick turn in the throw to second. Brian back safely. Ray Ordonez, the shortstop, took the throw. In this last four-game losing streak, the Cubs have scored a grand total of one run combined in the first four innings of every game. So if the Cubs could get on the board early in this one, at least they could put a little pressure on Harnish and take a little pressure off Kevin Foster. The pitch by Harnish and that misses upstairs as well. Two balls and no strikes. This is a very lively ballpark in the daytime. 338 down the line, 358 to straightaway left. Only 371 to the power alley, and the ball flies much better during the daytime than it does at night. The 2 0 delivery, and the pitch catches the corner for a strike call. That's actually that ball bent back over the plates, Tony. He wanted an outside corner, and that got. Most of the plate, Rhino pretty much taking all the way. Well, let's see if Rhino can move along McCray. If he can, then it'll be Grace who will be driving him in, put the Cubs on top. And Rhino trying to go the right side, fouls it off, and it's two balls and two strikes. Harness showed the Cubs a very good straight change at Wrigley Field. Now they knew that he had an overhand curveball, they knew he had a better than average fastball but I think the straight change surprised him and look for Harness to break it out here early this inning two and two the count and the pitch swing and a miss Sandberg goes down on strikes McCray still at second one out it brings up Mark race at 358 couple of homers 18 runs batted in Mark has been sitting on 18 for a little bit or thereabouts. Well, he's the man that broke the spell last night. A perfect game with two outs in the fourth inning. 
Bobby Jones mystifying the Cubs and Grace came up single to center field and that was that for the no hitter in the perfect game. Grace two for four last night but Gray off of second with one out. And Mark looks at strike one call. Now Husky and Johnson don't throw very well but Bernard Gilkey does. Tony Muser and Mark Grace tested him last night. He came up with his seventh outfield assist and that leads the major leagues in that department. VO one delivery and it's one ball one strike. I got to figure that Ordonez is going to sneak behind McCray one more time and try a pickoff play before this sequence is over. So Brian had best be heads up at second. Here's Ordonez. Step behind McCray. Mark looks at a strike there. One ball, two strikes. I would say you have to be careful, Wayne, with your strike calls today because Greg Bonet is as deliberate as they get behind the plate. He'll take a while to raise that right arm. Doesn't he, though? My goodness. Likes a little dramatic effect to it. Grace keeping himself alive by fouling off that pitch, although it looked like it was down low in the strike zone. One ball and two strikes. There you see how they've been hitting the first runner in the last four games to reach base in the first inning. But even more than that, as we told you, when you score just one run in the first four innings of four games, you know the opponents get on top early, and more times than not, it's tough to relinquish that lead. The one two delivery to Grace is down low and inside and it's two balls and two strikes in the game last night in three of the last five innings the Cubs got their leadoff man on base and were unable to score. One of the things they haven't been doing Wayne and they haven't had a lot of base runners so certainly it's not entirely the fault of Jim Riggleman but the Cubs have not been using the hit and run very much they have not been using the straight steal they've been stuck on 33 stolen bases for some time. 2-2 pitch to Grace. Ooh, and he almost offered at it. Three balls and two strikes. Grace has worked the count full on Pete Harnish. Well, when you're a veteran and you've got a good command of the strike zone, you're going to get a break. And Grace did there is Sammy Sosa waiting patiently on deck. With first base open, Wayne, I'd expect a slider in the dirt here from Harnish. One out. McCray at second. The pitch is golfed into shallow right field. Husky coming on, going back. Vizcaino, he makes the catch. Throw to second, not in time to get McCray. Brian, it's straight off the bag. He thought that was going to fall in, but was able to scamper back quickly enough before the throw from Vizcaino to Ordonez. Ordonez looked like a first baseman here. He knew it was going to be close at second as Brian McCray spent a long time between second and third. This is a very close play. Watch Ordonia stretching much like Bronia would, scooping this ball out of the dirt. And that was a very close call by Frank Pulley. Two men down, McCray still at second for Sammy Sosa. 227, nine homers, 24 runs batted in. Also three doubles and a triple. Chops it foul on the third base side. Sammy was in the uh, hitting cage underneath the stands here down the right field line at Shea Stadium for a good portion of the morning with hitting instructor Billy Williams. There's one thing that Sammy will do and do consistently Wayne and it's not only during the game where he gives you everything he's got. He takes as much batting practice as anybody that I've seen and when he can't get on the field he spends it in the batting cage trying to figure out what he's doing wrong. No balls and one strike here. And it's one and one. We've seen the Mets against Sosa stay away with the breaking ball, especially early in the count. They'll stay out there. And then as we saw Bobby Jones do last night, they'll come up inner portion of the plate and try to throw the fastball by him. So just when they get ahead. Sammy has a lot of history with Harnish. He's 10 for 34, 294. There's the pitch in the dirt. McCray advances the third as it gets away from Hundley. So the wild pitch moves McCray to within 90 feet with two men down. That's a good piece of base running because if you're not anticipating this ball get away, then you can't get the third. 
When the ball got away, McCray started, and when he realized it was going out of that little cutout circle around home plate, he was in at third easily. And you have to be an aggressive base runner to take advantage of that. Two balls in one strike with two out, and now McCray at third. Top of the first inning, no score. There's a high fly ball deep to left field and back to the wall. Gilkey, it's gone. Two nothing Cubs on Sammy Sosa's 10th home run of the season. That is number 25. So Sammy Sosa, a two run homer. And the Cubs go up by the score of two to nothing. Well, looks like the extra time in the cage paid off. And certainly Sammy Sosa got just about every bit of that, although Gilkey thought he had a shot. As it turned out, it was about 15 feet too far. And watch it again as Sammy gets a fastball in her portion and takes it way back. He's driven in 26 on his 10th home run. And more important than that, the Cubs have broken on top two to nothing. Well, Sammy Sosa with his 10th homer and Gonzalez even in the count one ball and one strike. That's more like it. Get on top early and then turn it over to your pitcher and hope they can hold them. Sammy's second career home run off Pete Harnish. Here's the hook and that misses down low. So Gonzo ahead in the count two balls and one strike. Pitch is lined into left field for a base hit for Louis Gonzalez. So Gonzalez who was robbed of a base hit by the official score last night who assessed an error on a smash at Jose Vizcaino off the bat of Louis Gonzalez does get a base hit here. And the Cubs still two men down bring up Scott service to the plate with the runner on first. In the first inning against Pete Harnish in the ball game at Wrigley Field with Grace aboard. Sammy also hit a two out homer. Then he later followed it up with a home run against the Poto to win the game. First pitch to service hits a fly ball to right field. The ball carries a bit. Butch Husky camps under it and makes the catch. And the inning is over. But the Cubs score the first two runs of the game on three hits. Sammy Sosa's 10th home run of the season. A two run shot has staked the Cubs to a 2 0 lead with the Mets coming to the plate. Stone back at Shea Stadium, New York Mets batting order for Dallas Green, Johnson, Vizcaino, Gilkey, Hunley, Bronya, Kent, Husky, Ordonez, and Harnish. The Pepsi Cubs defense, Gonzalez, McCray, and Sosa left to right, Gomez, Sanchez, Sandberg, and Grace in the infield, and the battery of Kevin Foster and Scott Service. Kevin 1 0 lifetime against the Mets, but the ERA very good at 257 in two previous starts. Including one on the 5th of May at Wrigley. Lance Johnson looks at a curveball down low. One ball, no strikes. Johnson and Vizcaino very similar to Grezolanic and Lansing in that they can really hurt you at the top. There's a strike and it's one and one. And the pitch. That's down low in the dirt. Two balls at one strike. Here's a look at Kevin this year. You see the ERA way up there, and this is eighth start. The walks have been fine. Too many hits per innings pitch. That's been the problem. Chops it off the plate to the shortstop. Sanchez. One away. But watch a couple of fine at bats against Harnish. This was a Wrigley Field in the first inning, and you see the fastball. It was up but not quite high enough and it's out and that's very high enough and this is almost the exact same pitch. I would think that Pete Harnish had probably figured out by now that if he throws that one it's going out of the ballpark. One out nobody on now for Jose Vizcaino and he lines the first pitch to him into center field for a base hit in front of Brian McCray. 
So the first hit of the afternoon for the Mets. One out single by Jose Vizcaino, and it brings up Bernard Gilkey. This is going to be the real challenge for Kevin Foster today because Gilkey has hit him better than anybody in the Mets lineup. All of those numbers piled up when Gilkey was a member of the Cardinals. But he has been a very tough out for Kevin Foster. Get a look at the numbers on Gilkey. 29 RBIs lead this team. One ball, no strikes. This game will runs occasionally, but not all that often. He's four out of five in the stolen base department. The Mets, as a team, don't try to run you out of the ballpark. They've only stolen 21 bases. They've been caught 11 times. Vizcaino at second. One man down. One ball, no strikes to count at the pitch from Foster. And that's two balls. So he's behind the count to Gilkey. Two balls and no strikes. Now keep this ball away from Gilkey. Because hitters will zone hit you here. And that means they'll pick out a little box middle in by to the waist and if you throw it there they'll hit it a long way. Quick toss over to first base not the best move by Kevin Foster. Base dealers have had their way against Kevin. And the 2 0 pitch sets up high ball three three balls and no strikes. Pretty big numbers being piled up by Henry Rodriguez. Two home runs last night. And Rodriguez knocking at the door of Barry Bonds for the lead in home runs. Rodriguez has 15. Barry has 16. Bottom of the first, 2 nothing Cubs and the pitch. Down low, ball four. Gilkey walks on four pitches. So now the Mets have runners at first and second with one out. And that brings up Todd Hundley. Hundley at 291. He's got eight homers and 26 runs knocked in. Also 10 doubles on the season so far. Somewhat surprising to me the fact that Hundley, who does not run very well, has yet to ground into a double play. So it shows me that he hits a lot of fly balls and that Dallas Green has moved the runners ahead of him when he gets in a situation like this. Hundley is seventh in the National League with a 600 slugging percentage. Runners off first and second for the Mets. Vizcaino at second. The breaking pitch in there for strike one. Frank Castillo handled Hundley last night, rendering him 0 for 3 on the evening. Frank Castillo handled a lot of people last night. Butch Husky being the exception. That pitch is in there for strike two call. Let's pause here for station identification. This is America's number one sports station. WGN-TV, Chicago. A sultry, hazy, sunshiny day at Flushing Meadow. Cubs leading 2-0. Bottom of the first. Mets threatened with one out. That pitch got off the glove of service, but no advance by the runners, and boy, did it knock down Hundley. Well, just in case Todd was looking for one of those soft curveballs away, Kevin Foster just reminded him that he was thinking about it. High, tight gas. And that'll get your attention. <laughs> it sure will. Well, Dallas likes that kind of baseball, and he always preached it wherever he's gone so he doesn't mind seeing a pitcher go up and in one ball two strikes two on one out bottom of the first Hunley fouls it off and the count remains one and two Kevin has gone six innings or more in four of his starts four of his seven starts but the longest he's gone is six and a third innings that was at San Francisco where he gave up just two runs on five hits one ball and two strikes the count on Hundley 
Hundley takes a high pitch and pops it up on the left side. Gomez now being waved off by Ray Sanchez, who backs up and makes the catch. So Hundley retired two men down. Bob Davidson was signaling infield fly rule all the way. And I think it's real important, Wayne, for Kevin Foster to get out of this first inning. And watch it again. Bob Davidson will come into your picture. You see him raise the right arm. That's the infield fly roll. As soon as he sees that the infield is going to catch the ball with their back to the outfield. So two men down for Rico Bronya. Bronya, 292, couple of homers, 15 runs batted in, also has eight doubles. Vizcaino at second, the runner at first, Bernard Gilkey. Pitch is wide, one ball, no strikes. The Cubs have completely shut down Bronya with a succession of change-ups and slow curves. The only problem will be if you fall behind him and then have to go to the fastball. So Foster wants to even out the count here at one and one if he can. You don't want to fall behind Bronya. Foster, quick whirl towards second. The ball off the glove of Ray Sanchez into center field. And the runners move up to second and third. And the throw from McCray over the head of Grace. He's got service there to back up. And we'll have to see if that's ruled as an error on Foster or on Ray Sanchez. The throw is high. But he got his glove like Ray on. Ray definitely should have caught the ball. I got to believe that's going as an error on Sanchez. And like everything else in New York, we're wrong. It's E1, error on Foster. Unbelievable. Maybe the official scorer thought he was throwing it to Mickey Rooney at second. <laughs> One ball, no strikes. Two out and the pitch down low. Nice block by service and now it's 2-0. and oh. So you get into that dangerous territory with Bronya now. You become more predictable at 0-2 well, or 2-0. Oh. Well, now you have first base open. It's a different at bat. Now you just can't give in. Under normal circumstances, even though they don't want to put a runner on intentionally, they will pitch tough or should pitch tough to Bronya in this spot with the time run at second. second to throw to the plate by Gonzalez not in time and it's a tie ball game. Rico Bronia with a single to left field to tie the game at two. You know Ralph I think uh, from a catcher standpoint that ball off the plate. So Rico Bronia wasn't allowing Foster to pitch around him. But you've got a pitcher that's wild to begin with. If you load him up, if you pitch around him in a situation like this, you've got a two-run lead. You try to pitch to Jeff Kent, and you end up walking him. That could lead to a big inning. But that pitch was off the plate, low and away to Bronia. And a good job by Bronia to hit the Absolutely. ball where it was pitched. Absolutely. So now Jeff Kent will step in. Kent hitting 267, 0 for 3 last night. He does have four home runs, one of the two this month for the Mets. And that was against the Cubs. And Kent takes a fastball for ball one. So the Mets bounce back to tie it with the help of the air on the throw to second base on the pickoff attempt. It was charged to the pitcher, but should have been handled by the shortstop. And Kent looks at ball two, two balls and no strikes. Bronia has not attempted a stolen base this year. The runner at first base. Two and all to Jeff Kent. And he's behind the fastball and fouls it back into the stands. And for a change here at Shea Stadium, a shirt sleeve crowd and another interesting point very little wind blowing here forecast for thunderstorms later on in the afternoon but I agree with you it's so refreshing to see uh, everybody out in shirt sleeves and shorts maybe spring is here spring has sprung at least today here in New York 
The 2 1 delivery to Kent, and this one popped up in the infield. Sanchez can't find it. Now he picks it up, and he makes the play. So a day game here at Shea is an adventure, and that adventure turned into the out that ends the inning, but the Mets get two, and the score at the end of one. The Mets two, and the Cubs two, and here's a word from your tri-state Jeep and Eagle leader. Top of the second inning, 2-2 ball game, and Pete Harney's getting set for his second inning. First and second, there were two outs, and the pitcher for the Cubs... Kevin Foster looking in at Scott's service. On this particular play, folks, you hear us talk about the daylight play all the time where the shortstop gets between the runner and the bag. This was a sign called by the catcher. Watch service drop the mitt. Foster looking only at service. Foster wheels to throw, and the throw high. Runners move up, and that set up the two-run RBI single by Rico Bronia. But see, it's not a daylight play here because he's not looking at the shortstop. But you saw Scott Service drop the mitt and the throw to second, even though it was high. But that was a design play by the Cubs. And Scott Service. Right. So one away in the fly ball to center field as Gomez leads it off. And that'll bring up Ray Sanchez. So an out on one pitch. And the score, two and two, as Sanchez bats for the first time. Gomez, incidentally, hitting 304 before the out with five home runs, 14 runs batted in. Sanchez, the shortstop. And he looks at the first pitch for a call strike. Interesting play by the Cubs and Scott Service because the pitcher really has to rely on his catcher or his eyes in that situation. Now the whole play is set up by the catcher. When the shortstop breaks, the catcher drops the mitt, and the pitcher turns and throws blindly at second base, knowing his shortstop's going to be there. And dug out of the dirt for a ball. Two balls, one strike to Sanchez. Sanchez taking over at shortstop with Vizcaino going to the Mets. And this ball, a fly ball to left center, it'll be playable for Gilkey. And two fly ball outs. Batting ninth, number 32. Hey, Mets fans, this break in the action is brought to you by Budweiser. Now's the time to enjoy that crisp, clean Budweiser taste. This Bud's for you. Now the batter will be Kevin Foster, not a bad hitting pitcher. He did start his career as an infielder. He has had two hits and 11 at-bats this year. And he gets hit by a pitch. So the pitch inside, and remember back in the first inning, the two-strike pitch to Todd Huntley going right over his head. There could be a connection. I think uh, it, it certainly appears to be. Pete Harnish uh, Center fielder Brian is one McGrath. of the guys in the National League you want on your side. Obviously, he's a guy who will protect his mates. But remember, that was a pitch in an 0-2 count. This appeared that Pete Harnish hits Kevin Foster intentionally. Fastball right in there that caught him on the arm. So Foster on at first base with two men out. A little interesting by play here. Well, Pete Harnish will be the third hitter up in the bottom of the second. Now the pitch is strike one. Here's the pitch to Hudley. 0-2 count. Runners on at first and second. A two-run lead. I mean, to me, that just looked like a pitcher coming inside, knocking a guy off the plate. And that one is off the plate. One ball and one strike to Brian McRae. McRae doubled his first time up in the gap in right center. Later on, scored the first run of the ball game, riding home on the home run by Sammy Sosa. Mets got two back in their half of the first, and it's tied at two right now. That next delivery ball, two, two balls and one strike. Brian McKay, Mc, McRae, the son of Hal McRae, who has managed in baseball, also was an outstanding hitter and a batting instructor. That puts a strike, and it's two and two. Lost to the run at first, not being held on by Bronia. Bronia playing off to the bag and behind the base runner. 
on that pitch in there. Strike three call. So the strikeout ends the inning. The second for Pete Harness. After one and a half innings, it is the New York Mets two and the Chicago Cubs two. And now here's a word from Nobody Beats the Wiz. Ball game, bottom half of the second inning. The Mets coming up with Butch Husky to lead it off. Husky with a home run in last night's ball game. He had two for three, and he now has hit two home runs and has driven in nine with an average of 236. Husky's home run coming off a high outside fastball last night going over the left field fence. And he takes a high inside fastball for ball one. After this ball game, the kids will run the bases here. Boy, they're permitting. Should be a tremendous amount of fun for the kids running the bases here at Shea Stadium. As the count goes to two balls and no strikes. And don't forget, tomorrow, Mother's Day. And a big promotion on Mother's Day. High fastball for ball three. Women 15 and over at the 140 game against the Cubs tomorrow will receive a Mother's Day tote bag. 3 0 to Husky. And a walk on four pitches as Husky leads off the second. Second walk given up by Foster. And that'll bring up Ray Ordonez. Ray won for three last night, hitting 300 for the year as Ferguson Jenkins, the Hall of Famer, seven time 20 game winner, calls out to the bullpen to get something going out there as Foster has struggled in the early part of this game. Right hander in the bullpen, Rodney Myers loosening up. Ordonez, earlier this year, for the 14 game hitting streak for the Mets, the longest by any Met, and the third longest in the National League so far. So far. One ball, no strikes. Five in a row out of the strike zone for Kevin Foster. And he tries first base this time and is wild over there. Ordonez. Hitting ahead of the pitcher. There's a strike and the count one and one with Odunia's batting eighth ahead of the pitcher. The sacrifice is not really a consideration, but the third baseman, Leo Gomez, playing even with the bag at third. Well, it's still early in the year. They don't know Ordonez uh, that well. We haven't seen Ordonez try to bunt for a base hit yet. When in doubt, play even with the bag and you protect yourself both ways. And that pitch out of the strike zone. Two balls and one strike. Well, this just drives a manager crazy when a pitcher is having control problems. It also drives your defense crazy. They can't get set. Jim Ruggleman, formerly a minor league infielder. Looks kind of disgusted, doesn't he? He certainly does. Another throw to first base. Kind of a tough count to put the, although an ideal count for the hit run, but in a tough situation to put the hit and run on with the pitcher being so wild. Yeah. Two balls, one strike. And it swung on and fouled off, and they did not have the runner going on the pitch. Two balls and two strikes. Oh, Dorn is is a man who makes pretty good contact most of the time. He has struck out 15 times. He has walked only six times, so he'll swing. The 2-2 pitch, and it's outside. And that fills out the count, and we'd have to believe the runner will be going on this pitch. 
One of the key things that happened in last Sunday's game was Ray Ardonia's not running on a 3-2 pitch in the ninth inning. Cubs eventually won that game on Sosa's homer. And the runner is going. The pitch looped into left center field for a base hit. Husky will go to third, and the Mets have runners at first and third with nobody out here in the bottom half of the second inning in the 2-2 game. I'll tell you, that O stands for ouch after that swing. A little Macarena in the background. <laughs> this ball saws Ordonez off, but he will gladly trade a bat for a hit any day. Any hitter would. But that had to sting a little bit. Well, he'll take it. <laughs> o for ouch. <laughs> so runners at first and third, no one out, and Pete Hardy's in a bunting situation, and not necessarily the bunt for the squeeze play, but the bunt to get the runner down to second base. Third baseman Gomez, even with a bag at third. Infield set back at short and second. And Pete Arnish, who has not had a base hit, gets the bunt sign, takes the ball, and it's called a strike. Arnish 0 for 7 so far this year. It's also a situation, Mike Cubbage, the third base coach, knows this. A situation that uh, Kevin Foster, if he has the desire to do so, he cannot retaliate against Pete Harnish. Harnish hitting Foster after Foster knocked Todd Hunley down. So here you have first and third and nobody out. No way can you retaliate right now. You certainly don't want to hit the batter in this spot. No. One strike to count. And Harnish bunts it down. It successfully out toward the first base side, almost thrown away at first. Good play by Sandberg, covering the first base for the out. And on the sacrifice, Ordonius down to second base to join Husky at third. Center fielder Lance Johnson. That'll bring up Lance Johnson. Lance Johnson's going to be walked intentionally, but a good sacrifice by Harnish. You see the third baseman. Leo Gomez charging and scampering back to third once the ball is bunted toward first, fielded by Kevin Foster, who almost threw that ball away at first base. So now the intentional walk to load up the bases, and remember this, Foster's had trouble getting the ball over, so he has nowhere to put the next batter. Tie ball game at two. Johnson takes ball three. Johnson grounded out to short his first time up. ball four so the bases are loaded for the New York Mets and Jose Vizcaino the batter and he has a single and a run scored in his first plate appearance second baseman Jose Vizcaino. Rodney Myers has thrown enough to be ready to come into this ball game about the first pitch is very important as we talk about all the time but with the bases loaded it is particularly important if Foster misses with the first pitch, that could set up the at-bat because this Kaina will know that he's going to get a fastball 1-0. and And the pressure would be on Foster, who also knows he hasn't got command yet in this ball game, and he misses with the first pitch for ball one. Every hitter loves this situation. You know you're going to get the heater. One ball, no strikes, no place to put you. Outfield very shallow. Foster's 1-0 pitch, ball two, and it's two balls and no strikes, and now the pressure's even stronger. And it's more and more likely that the fastball will be the next delivery. Ideal hitting position for Vizcaino. Two at all, the count. And he goes after a pitch that was out of the strike zone, so... This guy ain't no overly eager, and that helped out. A little too anxious Foster. on that high fastball, right? Come on, guys! So instead of a 3-0 count, it's two balls and one strike. What a difference that makes. Right down the middle, and hit foul down the third base side. So it's two and two, and... 
Foster has a little chance to breathe here. For the Mets, the runner at third base, Bruton. Butch Husky walked on four pitches. Moved to third with a 3-2 and the runner going. And a base hit by Ordonez. And then Johnson, the runner at first base, walked intentionally. High ball game at two. The Cubs with two in the first. The Mets duplicated that in their half. Now the Mets batting in the bottom of the second inning. And it's ball three. Vizcaino almost swung at that one. Well, you could see how frustrated Vizcaino was. He slapped the bat on the barrel of the bat, saying, quit swinging at bad balls. Watch. So it's a full count. Nowhere to put him. And the pressure on the pitcher, Kevin Foster. Right down the middle, it's fouled back out of play, and the count remains at three and two. Can he do it again? Ferguson Jenkins, one of the great control pitchers of all time, looking on at his pitcher struggling on the mound. And it's Gilkey in the on deck circle. Again, at three balls and two strikes. And it's again fouled away. So Foster able to get two in the strike zone on his 3 2 count. I think Jose's just got to lower the sights right now. Vulnerable to that high fastball. Just lower the sights. They're not calling the high fastball a strike anyway nowadays. Said they were. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the umpires do it the way they want to do it. Three balls, two strikes once again. Third time for Kevin Foster. And he hits another foul ball, and that was ball four right there. Got to lower the sights. Down scope. But Foster says up scope. He better get out of this, or he isn't going to submerge and stay alive. Three balls, two strikes for the fourth time. Base is loaded for the Mets. They are tied at 2-2. And now Vizcaino asks for time. Controlled aggressive aggressiveness is the key right here if you're the hitter. Again, the 3-2 pitch. And he got the swinging strike. And that pitch also borderline right there. But oh, this guy, you know, that was a ball. Goes after those high pitches yeah. and it cost him. Yeah, that was not a good at bat by Jose Vizcaino falling ahead of the count. And then swinging at ball four. He swung at ball four three times. And at ball three once on the 2-0 pitch. So now two men out. And it will be up to Bernard Gilkey who walked on four pitches his first time up. Infield dropping back with two men away. Bases loaded. 2-2 ball game, and it's ball one. That strikeout, the first by Kevin Foster, and a big one for him, but helped out by Vizcaino. Boy, what a difference things are, and little things are in ball games. And Bernard Gilkey does it again for the New York Mets. They take the lead, four to two. Bernard Gilkey continues to come through time and time and time again. Looks like a changeup from Foster. Pretty good location, but Gilkey right on it. Two run score. The Mets take the lead for the first time in the game, and what a burden that lifts off the shoulders of Jose Vizcaino, who had a terrible at bat with the bases loaded and one out. But now that at bat, everybody forgets about it. All right, big help right there, and the batter will be Todd Huntley. Yoki with his 30th and 31st runs batted in, and the Mets on top by two and a throw to first base. Good base running by. Johnson as he goes first to third and the base hit the left center. The runners at first and third. Two men out. The Mets leading four to two. And Hundley who popped up to short batting for the second time. And he gets a strike for strike one. 
First pitch to Bernard Gilkey was high. You see service sitting outside. Foster's all over the place. And then the changeup looked like a pretty good pitch, but Gilkey picked it up. It didn't fool him at all. Not fooled a bit. He stayed right on it and drilled it in the left center field. A one strike pitch to Todd. He just misses hitting that ball out of the park. Towering fly ball to right field. It'll be playable for Sosa. He makes the catch and retires the side. But the Mets get two, and the score at the end of two. It's the Mets four, the Cubs two, and here's a word from WCBS FF. Four to two, and coming up for the Cubs, Ryan Sandberg to lead it off. Good crowd here today on a perfect day for baseball. The first good day the Mets have had here in New York. They ran into three outstanding days in Florida, and now this one today. This copyrighted telecast is authorized under television rights granted by Sterling Doubleday Enterprises LP. Solely for the entertainment of our audience, any publication, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Sterling Doubleday Enterprises LP is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charging a mission for a showing, is likewise prohibited. And the first pitch to Sandberg by Pete Harnish, the called strike. Sandberg struck out his first time up, swinging at a ball in the dirt. I mentioned earlier that Sandberg is a future Hall of Famer, and there's no doubt about it. The best fielding percentage ever by a second baseman at 990. And he goes after the breaking ball, strike two. You know, I'm not too sure that there's no doubt about it. There's always some doubt. Well, Especially it, now, because I, you just brought it up. <laughs> well, listen, nobody has more respect for this guy than I do. And I think uh, all the baseball world, if you're a fan or a guy who follows the game, you got to respect what Ryan Sandberg has done. And he misses, well, he fouls the fastball off. I uh, think he there could was, hurt himself now. I, I think there was concern before when he laid out a year and a half, and now to come back and try to struggle, even though I don't think now his struggle will be that prolonged. I think if he struggles this year, I think he'll retire. Don't you? I think he will because he had that inclination before and did retire for a year and a half, although it was due to marital problems. But uh, he could hurt his chances and if he has two or three years where he doesn't really continue to play as a regular player. Yeah, I don't know if the Cubs would, uh, would re-sign him. It depends on what they have. This ball hit deep to left. It's back in that left field corner. Can it be caught? It cannot be caught. Gilkey with a nice try, and Sandberg ends up with a double. Looks so, like the glove and the ball hit the fence at the same time. Fence knocking the ball out. Gilkey, his glove and the ball appeared to arrive at the same time. Nope. He just dropped it. Didn't get it in the pocket. Nope. I guess he thought the ball was higher than it was. He thought he was going to have to jump for it, but it hit the heel of the glove and bounces out. It's going to be a double for Sandberg, I think. No, they haven't scored it yet. And now the batter will be Mark Grace, who popped the second his first time up, and he pops this one up down to the third base side. It'll be in foul territory. Can't back there to make the play. And the dangerous Mark Sand Mark Grace is out. Well, there have been a, a lot of bad at bats uh, in this ball game. You remember Sandberg in the first inning, McCray on at second, nobody out. Sandberg struck out, and now with Sandberg on at second, a guy who's one of the more dependable guys for moving runners along in the National League, Mark Grace, pops out left side. Vizcaino didn't get the run home with less than two outs. We're not saying it's easy, folks. I guarantee you I had a ton of bad at bats, and so did you. No question about it. Uh, nobody's had five, 6,000 at bats where you don't go back to, to the dugout and say, why did I do that? Why did I do it? What why I, didn't I think? Yeah, yeah. Why didn't, I, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do what I was planning on doing? What Grace had to do in that spot was to definitely pull the ball. He did the total opposite. He did it on the third base side. And he is a great hitter. The 1-0 pitch, and it's a breaking ball to Sosa, who had a two-run home run his first time up. Sosa damaging the Mets again. He's hit four home runs against the Mets in five ball games. 
has a total of 10 home runs so far this year with 26 runs batted in and four of those home runs against the Mets. Two of them game winners and he goes after a breaking ball there and it's two and one and that was a good pitch. He just can't throw Sosa fastballs when the count is in his favor. He is a free swinger and he does have a propensity to swing through a lot of pitches. 47 strikeouts for Sammy this year leads the majors. Two balls, one strike. And again, he comes back with that hard slider and it's fouled back into the stands, also in a good spot. That home run pitch, the two run homer, right down the pipe. Couldn't have a better pitch to hit there. No. Nope. Arnes came in and tore up the dugout after throwing that pitch. He knew it was wrong and he had made a big mistake. Two and two the count. Sosa the type of hitter that hits a lot of mistakes. He gets another good pitch to hit. Growls it in the left center. A fastball and it's caught. Great play by Gilkey. And he takes an extra base hit away and what a play by Gilkey. I think this is a situation where you just have to give Sosa, Sosa credit, but more credit to Bernard Gilkey. Sosa for hitting it, Gilkey for catching it. I thought that was a pretty good pitch. I thought that ball was right out on the black. But Sosa just reaching out with those long arms and hit it on the good part, but it's run down by Gilkey. Call oh, the runner back to second base, two men out, and Luis Gonzalez the batter. And the first pitch and off speed pitch for ball one. Here's that pitch to Sammy Sosa. 2-2. Two -two. You see that ball's right out there. But a fastball. You throw fastball hitters fastballs. It just depends on how you package it. It, it depends on how you surround it. I mean he got to it by throwing a 2-0, two 2-1 -two slider. That package almost had some Christmas <laughs> ribbons on it though. <laughs> The 1 0 pitch, and it's inside. So it's 2 0 to Luis Gonzalez, who singled his first time up. His single to the opposite field, and that's the way he likes to hit. He hits a lot of balls the other way. Big thing about Sammy Sosa is he's a good low ball hitter. Anything in the zone that's down, he has good hacks at. Two balls, no strikes. And that one, ball three, 3 0. Sosa is certainly well recommended. 30 home runs twice in his major league career. And also backed it up in those years with 30 stolen bases. He is a good package. 3-0 pitch, ball four, and that puts runners at first and second. The time run at first base as the Mets lead four to two. And brings up a dangerous hitter in Scott Service. Service with seven home runs, Gonzalez with one. So the Mets have to contend with a fellow that can hit the ball hard. First walk given up by Harnish. He doesn't walk many. That's his sixth so far in 32 innings. It was a four pitch walk. Service at 289 for the year. the slider low and away he did not swing says first base umpire Larry Poncino runner at second base Ryan Sandberg runner at first base Luis Gonzalez and they represent the time runs in this ball game with the Mets leading by a score of four to two we're in the top half of the third two men out and a fastball missing again and it's two balls and no strikes and now service in a good position. Two and oh the count. Cubs trying to break a four game losing streak. Round ball a third but foul and it will go to two balls and one strike. Cubs start their action only a game and a half out of first. Houston in first place. 
everybody in the national record. Everybody in the National League Central is a game and a half out of first. <laughs> That's about right. They are, except for St. Louis, they're two and a half out. And they're in the bottom. Montreal with the best record in baseball. Of course, the Mets are in the Eastern Division with Montreal, and they trail by eight and a half. And fouled to the first base side out of play. Two balls and two strikes. Harney's trying to work out of this jam. It started with a double by Sandberg. And Harney's aided on a great play by Gilkey on a drive to deep left center field. That saw Gilkey take Sosha on that fly ball catch. Two and two. And a hard ground ball pulled foul. Another good pitch by Harney. Slow outside slider. That keeps the count at two balls and two strikes. And the Braves in second place. Game and a half back in Montreal. They have won six in a row. And Florida going full speed ahead. They have won five in a row starting with the Mets. A sweep of the Mets in Florida. And now it goes to a full count three and two. On deck batter Leo Gomez. And the runners will be moving with the pitch on the three two count. There you see Gomez. Fired by the Cubs from Baltimore. This has not been a pitcher's delight. The 3 2 pitch. Runners go, and the ball is popped up in foul territory. And Gronia will look, and that's all. As the count remains at three balls and two strikes on the foul ball. Service has taken a lot of swings that are described as the day after a night game swing. Catchers get uh, very tired. You got to keep in mind that Pete Harnish, you know, left had a good night's sleep, didn't perform last night. Scott Service caught nine innings last night. Hot today. So once again, Pete will try a 3 2 pitch. And it's granted to the shortstop for Donius, who goes across the field the first. And that retires the side. So Pete Harnish survives. One hit, one walk, two men left. The score at the end of two and a half innings. The Mets four, the Cubs two. Here's a word from Powerade. Heading here in the bottom half of the third, leading by a score of four to two. Enrico Bronio, who drove in two runs for the Mets in the first, will be the leadoff batter. One of those two runs in the first for the Mets, unearned. As Bronius steps in for his second try against Kevin Foster, who has struggled through the first two innings. And the first pitch by Foster, ball one. Foster with a lifetime record of 18 wins and 18 losses. Good fastball, a strike call, one ball, one strike. Bronio with his base hit, raising his average eight points. He's hitting 300 now with two home runs, 17 runs batted in. Breaking ball, pull foul. One ball and two strikes. Bronio not swinging well, although he has gotten some hits that have kept his average or it's very respectable at 300. Takes that pitch and it's a ball, two balls and two strikes. First, he had the knee problem, had the knee scope last November for the medial collateral in early March, and now the tendonitis in the right shoulder. Goes after a high slider, hits it out to deep left. It's going, going, it is gone, goodbye. Rico Bronia. And the Mets lead it by a score of five to two. Third 
Well, as this man sitting next to me knows, there is healing power in home runs. <laughs> Boy, can you get well quick. Man, it's the best medicine in the world. <laughs> it beats that chicken broth all the way and the first pitch to Jeff Kent ball one saying if they could bottle swings like this would this would uh, hospitals would be out of business right keeps, dri keeps drifting and drifting and drifting Gonzalez runs out of room 5-2 New York Abronia is third home run of the year the Mets leading 5-2 and Jeff Kent with a count of one ball and no strikes and now it goes to 2-0 like uh, he was dissatisfied with that swing that until he sees one. it. No? Well, it wasn't a good pitch to hit. But he sees it keep going and going and going and going. It's his third home run of the year. And Ferguson Jenkins out to the mound to talk to his pitcher. That home run, the 11th home run he has given up this year. Last year he led the major leagues in home runs allowed with 32. And now Fergie going back to the bench. Rodney Myers throwing again in the bullpen for Chicago. Two balls, no strikes to Jeff Kent, who popped to short his first time up, hitting 265 for the year with four home runs. And that pitch outside, ball three, three and oh. That home run by Bronia. Only the third home run the Mets have hit in the month of May. A 3 0 pitch, ball four. So the home run and a four pitch walk to follow. And the Mets have a runner first with no one out, and that'll be it for Kevin Foster. That was his fourth walk. One of them was intentional. And he is out of the ball game. Jim Riggleman, the manager of the Cubs, says, Son, that's it. Well, he also, Foster was going to leave the mound, and Jim Riggleman put his left hand there, and he said, wait until the pitcher arrives. Managers don't like that for pitchers to leave, and just checking with, uh, not that all pitchers do that to show a manager up, but managers don't like that. And it's our chance to leave. This call to the bullpen is brought to you by 9X. We'll be right back after these messages. Rodney Myers, a new pitcher, his first pitch to Butch Husky, a high, a high fastball for ball one. Husky walked on four pitches his first time up. And, of course, batting for the first time against Rodney Myers. And that's ball two. Cubs trading a R. Myers for an R. Myers, not actually a head-to-head -head trade. But Randy Myers, of course, a great relief pitcher pitching for the Cubs in the past couple of years, and now a Rodney Myers. And Husky gets a 2-0 fastball and fouls it back out of play. Randy Myers now toiling for his ex-manager, Davey Johnson, down Baltimore away. 2-1 to Husky hitting 236, two home runs, nine runs batted in. Home run in last night's ball game. And he reaches for a fastball and fouls it out of play two and two. There's a lot more baseball action to come, so don't go away. Sit back, relax, and open a nice cold Beechwood Age Budweiser. This Bud's for you. Runner at first base. And it's bounced to the hole in the right field for a base hit. Kent going for third, and he goes in with no throw, and the Mets have runners at first and third as Husky punches it to right field for a base hit. That was a nasty pitch from Rodney Myers and a good approach by Butch Husky. You don't have the same swing at all pitches. Sometimes you have to go to the defense. Just like Warner Wolf goes to the videotape, <laughs> Butch Husky goes to the defense, slaps it the other way. <laughs> Sammy Sosa did not elect to throw across the third base, so Mets with runners at first and third. No one out, leading by a score of 5-2, to two, and Ray Ordonia is the batter. Infield is in for a play at the plate, 
And the first pitch by Myers, a called strike. Pretty good play when you think about it. You have the infield in with nobody out, runners on the corners. You're not conceding the run because the pitcher's the next hitter. You have to be aware, if you're the runner on at third base, where the infielders are playing here. One strike to Kent or Adonis. And it's right over his head. He gets under it. The runner at third, Husky, holds. The runner at first goes to second. And the Mets have runners at second and third in the wild pitch. Well, I'll tell you, that was really close to Ray Ardonez. The bat went flying toward first base, and Ray got down quickly. This is very close to hitting him. Whoa. Obviously unintentional. I mean, Jeff Kent had an idea about coming home, but then he sees it doesn't go far enough away, but put the fear of the Lord in you, boy, pitches like that. Those are close to see about half of your life when that ball's going by. Now they're going to walk Ordonez intentionally to set up a chance for the force play at home and or the double play. That's leading five to two and they'll have the bases loaded with no one out as they bat here in the bottom half of the third. Ralph, in last night's ball game, Butch Husky was the runner at first base after getting a second hit with one out. Dallas Green went to Chris Jones as the runner at first base. And Jones eventually scored on the double by Carl Everett. I said in the game that I thought that Everett should have been the pinch runner and Chris Jones the pinch hitter. I checked with Bobby Wine, Dallas's right-hand man, as you see there before the game, and Carl Everett has a slightly... Uh, pulled groin and because of that they didn't want him running and would have preferred him hitting and that's why they put Jones in there I criticized the play at the time and I just wanted to clear up the whole thing going to Wino and Wino telling me that Everett had the pulled groin and that's the reason they worked it that way and had Jones in for defense and not always privy to all the information right they don't want to give it out that's so. right the play pulled off by Green certainly worked, and there was a good reason for it. Bases loaded with Harney Savatter. He is 0 for 7 this year, and he looks outside, and it's one ball and one strike. Bases loaded, no one out. Mets leading 5 to 2. They're batting in the bottom half of the third inning. Tough to put on a squeeze play here with the bases loaded because you only need a force play at home. Don't have to tag the runner. And it's chopped out to the first base side. A good play by Kent coming in to score. No, he called him out. I called that one wrong. I thought he was in there. But the throw beat him. And there is a case of the fact that the force play was the only way they could get him. He had Jeff Kent is not a fast runner. And Mark Grace playing in. Right call. It was the right call, and the fact he didn't have to tag him was the difference in the call. Grace makes the throw in perfectly. And the Cubs get the out. The Mets don't get the run, and the score stays at 5-2. to two. The base is still loaded, and Lance Johnson the batter. Lance 0 for 1. He also was walked intentionally. up a third then coming in to score and scoring is Husky and the Mets now lead at six to two Johnson with a sack fly RBI and the Mets have taken a four run lead on a line drive like that often the runner at third has the tendency to break toward home but you have to have the wherewithal to get back and tag up the throw by McCray late at home the appeal play by Gomez, the third baseman, and third base umpire Bob Davidson said he did not leave too soon. Husky took the two steps forward and then got back in time to tag. And now the batter, Jose Vizcaino, and he fouls off his first pitch at strike one. Jose, one for two in today's ballgame, a single his first time up and a run scored. He struck out in his next at bat. 
There's the appeal play. Gomez saying that Husky may have left too soon, but Bob Davidson says no. And the next delivery of ball, one ball and one strike. Bob Davidson, the third base umpire. That's with runners at first and second. And Vizcaino takes a call strike, and it's one ball and two strikes. Jose originally signed as a free agent by the Dodgers, went to the Cubs, and now with the New York Mets in one of the Mets' best trades. Anthony Young was traded for him. And the fastball, strike three call. That will end the inning, but the Mets coming up with two big ones, and they have put two runs on in each of the first three innings, and they lead by a score of six to two. And now here's a word from Budweiser. Well, the Mets with two runs in the first, two in the second, two in the third, and leading by a score of six to two and coming in for the play-by-play -play on this beautiful baseball day, Tim McCarver. And you folks may recall that back on the 26th of April in Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Pirates scored 10 runs in the first five innings. They scored two in the first, two in the second, two in the third, fourth, and fifth. And that was the first time in this century that a team had scored two runs, exactly two runs, in each of the first five innings. So wouldn't it be bizarre if the Mets hung a two-spot in the fourth and a two-spot in the fifth to tie Pittsburgh in that weird category? <laughs> if it happens, let's go to the racetrack. Yeah, <laughs> really. Bet the number two horse. <laughs> Leo Gomez. Flied to center his first at bat. Six to two, New York. Trying to make it two in a row over the struggling Cubs. Cubs winning that dramatic game at Wrigley Field last Thursday on the Sosa home run. Gomez deep to center. Johnson on the track. Hauls it in. One out in the fourth inning, and we take a look at our National League scoreboard. Only one game this afternoon. Dodgers and Cardinals scoreless after two and a half. John Smoltz won his seventh game last night, the only seven-game winner in the majors. Padres and Reds, Rockies, Marlins, and Houston up at the Big O in Montreal. Or Henry Rodriguez with two home runs in last night's game. Well, in our Toyota American League scoreboard, the Red Sox winning. Milwaukee winning. And another day game, Minnesota at Oakland, of course, later on this afternoon. And the Coast games this evening. And the count, two balls and no strikes to Ray Sanchez. And there's a strike, and we are absolutely delighted to have in our booth one of the most popular guys in this country. Jerry Seinfeld. Yes. Jerry, how you doing? Great, Tim. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to At have Shea you here. Stadium. Hi, Ralph. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Good to see you. Wow, a baseball tie. <laughs> <laughs> you actually are a fan. you got to wear these things. Especially and when a, they're given to you, right, that's Ralph? That's exactly and a, right. And a baseball bat tie clip. <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm trying to get, get my identity that? just close to yours, see? So I want everybody to know that I'm involved with baseball. And... Uh, you don't have that problem. All you do is just no. show up on television. People know I'm involved with baseball. Well, you have been involved as a Mets fan for a lot of years, That's especially right. the 86 season, right? That's right. I was here. I was here for game six, game seven, and we did a big uh, show with Keith Hernandez. I remember the show. That was the uh, the, the Grassy Knoll show. That's right. That's now, right. He had a tough part to play. He had to play himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he struggled with it. <laughs> What I want to know is why you cut out George Steinbrenner out of that episode he did. <laughs> Boy, we're getting right to it. <laughs> You're watching Mets Baseball 96 on UPN 9 WWR TV, Secaucus, New Jersey. And we're with right. Jerry Seinfeld. And Robin Jennings is the pinch hitter for the pitcher, Rodney Myers. And he takes outside ball 1-6-2 Mets on top. 
George Steinbrenner was very nice to come out and, and, and film up the episode for us, but it, it was one of those shows that ran so long. It was uh, 12 minutes long, and the show was 22 minutes, so we had to cut out two balls, we could. Two balls and no strikes to Jennings. But George was a very good sport about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Tim, I noticed you were sitting down when I came in. I was. Have you, have you changed your style? Well, that, you, you observe everything, yeah. don't you? <laughs> and that, that's one of the secrets of your success. Nothing gets by you that... Yeah, that, they pay uh, me for that. ...acute awareness of yours. But I was sitting down, and, I, you know, occasionally I'll sit down, but you're right. Most of the time I stand up and I broadcast. You feel that you get more energy? On your feet. I, I think I feel like I, I made my living in a crouch for 21 years, and now I'm making up for it. <laughs> now, what he really wants to be is you, a stand-up comedian, so that's why he stood up when you walked in. I to... don't have the material Jerry does, though. <laughs> it's a good thing you got the crowd facing the other way. <laughs> Three balls and a strike to Robin Jennings with Ray Sanchez on at second. One out here in the fourth inning, and the fastball misses. I guess I've been missing. Yeah, let's not uh, lose track of the game I'm here. I'm too involved with our guest, Jerry Seinfeld. That show is eight years old now. Is that right? Seven. Eight, seven? Believe it or not. My gosh. We're syndicated now in many of the stations throughout the country. Uh huh. That Jenny. ball's popped up on the right side, and it looks like it's going to be caught, and it is. Always wanted to do play-by-play. -play. Not too bad. Your <laughs> timing's perfect. The cadence is perfect. Yeah, yeah. but he's, he's had experience now. You've done play-by-play -play for the Yankees, haven't you? Yeah, one time I did it. But uh, I'm a Mets fan. Well, there are two outs, a man on second. Take it away. It's 6-2. to two. Mets on top. All right. Well, here we are. You're watching Brian, Brian McCray, center fielder. Number 56. Kind of a high number for a center fielder. Odd number. That's my favorite move, the flip up of the bat after the strike or the foul tip. I've, I've tried many times to get that. Can we get a replay on that? Now watch here. This move there, that one. I love that. Well, you know, Jerry, that beats the one where you tap the mud out of your spikes and you miss your feet. Yeah. You hit your leg and break your leg. Now that's one you don't want to fool with. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by how the the college players never have those little moves until they get into the big leagues. Because they're using aluminum bats, right? It's one of the reasons. Is that one of the reasons? Maybe. Oh. That's the other one. Just stand there. Don't walk away. You going to stay with us for another half inning? Sure. Okay. And now here's Brian? a word from Nobody Beats the Waz. <laughs> <laughs> If the voice sounds familiar, well, no wonder. Jerry Seinfeld, our guest in the booth. And, of course, Ralph and I have to be on your show now that you're doing play-by-play. -play That's here. right. If yeah. you could just sign here <laughs> and here. Uh, what am I reading? Our Nobody Beats the, the New Dodge Quiz. Nobody Beats the New Dodge Quiz. Nobody Beats but the New Dodge <laughs> Quiz. <laughs> and here it is. Which mid-'70s MVP was the only catcher ever to lead a league in singles good if question you, isn't it? if you know the answer to this one your personal life is a shambles <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing something wrong huh? get a life right <laughs> bernard gilkey leads it off here in the top of the fifth inning with the mets on top six to two and he fouls it away nothing in one to bernard where are my friends i'm here with a bunch of uh, writers from my show tim and alan where are they? There they are. They're waving. Those are the guys that write the show. I mean, those guys in the upper deck. Yeah, there. yeah. And the, and the, <laughs> the white house. Where they Bob used to Buker. hang the cage. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Euchre seats. The Bob Euchre seats. Anyway, we're winning the game. We're, we're kicking the hell out of these cubbies here. There are your writers there. The slider okay. from... Oh, do they have a shot of them? Terry Adams, yep. I think we can get another shot if we could, Jeff. One ball, two strikes to Bernard Gilkey. Oh. They're in that. They're all at the front of that skybox there. Oh no, that's not them. Oh, they're they're Bastard. all the way on the right. Yeah, <laughs> that's my girlfriend waving. Oh, it is. Yeah, that's. And now they'll get a shot. Give us a scoop. How serious is this? Most eligible bachelor in the world. Really? How serious is it? 
Yoki down on strike. This is really like a Mike Wallace interview here. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, first, that's not them. Those, do those guys look funny? <laughs> no, these, no, those We're are not, some rednecks. These, these kids are... Are those your riders right no, there? No, keep going. No, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> no, no. Are they in the ballpark? Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is getting more and more depressing. Wait, I think you're too far out. It's right before the... Yeah, right before where the glass starts. Do people really want to see the riders? <laughs> <laughs> Terry Adams, by the way, the right-hander in for the Cubs. Nothing in one to Todd Huntley. They're not that good looking. No, we're, we're not. We want to no. make sure that you know that we are not by any means grilling you up here. <laughs> No, uh, not by any because, means. because especially when we have you do the new Dodge quiz, that's how serious this broadcast is. <laughs> Todd Huntley takes a fastball low, two balls and a strike to Todd. Seinfeld Brownies. Yeah. This is really nice. Sent over from Fred Wilpon. I'll tell you, show business is fantastic. It's great, isn't it? What yeah. a life. <laughs> two balls and a strike to Huntley. Six to two Mets here in the fifth. That ball has popped up. And it's going to come down, and it's going to be fighting the sun. Makes the play. Nothing like it. Finishing your brownie and doing play by play. Where's that down at home? I said the fifth. This is the fourth inning. Oh, but, God. Jeff, you think we ought to have the answer to our new Dodge quiz? We've given the folks at home a chance to think about the answer. My answer would be Thurman Munson. Is it usually this hard, the question? Yes, they are. Well, That's why a, we got you up here. Do you win a new Dodge? Mm -hmm. Oh, it, Munson, ALVP in 1976. Mm. Tim McCarver. Only because I knew Thurman hit a lot of singles uh, in the 1970s. I did not, however, know that he led the league in singles for a catcher. Odd. Yeah, they're usually stronger. And Thurman was usually stronger. Great player, Thurman Munson. Yeah. Nothing won to Rico Bronya. 6-2 Mets here in the fourth. Ralph just taking it easy. Well, we, uh, I'm overwhelmed up here. I mean, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to ask you, though, when you come out to a ballpark, how do you get away? I mean, uh, people got to be all over you, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah, but that's that's got to be tough. Oh, that, that ball is hit very well. Deep into the right center field. It's going back. It's against the wall. Oh, it's off the wall. That's going to be extra bases. Going for three, there won't be a play, and he's in with a triple, Rico Bronia. Let's hear it for him. And he only needs a double for the cycle. He's, he's got, got the right. dinger, the single. Wow. He's got the hard one, the three base hit. Yeah, and he made it easily. You don't see... He's not that fast. No, he's not a fast. No, so no, he is not that fast. I don't want to say it too loud, but <laughs> whisper it. Yeah, <laughs> you got to hit a ball hard for a guy like this. It's a, almost a stand-up triple. Yeah, all, you got to have a lot of loft on a ball like that for a guy who's not a fast runner to get around to third base. Nothing in one to Jeff Kent with Brony at third, two outs, and six to two New York. Tim, when you hit a triple and you hit a lot, you hit a lot of triples. I hit a few. Is it, is, it, is it a little disappointing when you pull in there a third thing? Gee, I almost, almost hit it out. That's a good question, but the answer is no. It's, it's. And that's going to score a run. Uh, no, no, no it's not. It did, but it, it, it didn't count. You stick around for another half inning, will you? Okay. All right, still 6-2 to two, New York. We go to the fifth, and Jerry Seinfeld still with us after this from International Paper. Yeah, well, the fifth inning, our guest... And we are so happy to have him at the booth doing some play by play, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> That's the Seinfeld writing staff. Some of the smartest, most mature guys I've ever had the pleasure to work with. I'll tell you, if you need some guys that show up on time and in good condition, this is the group. Are you, you were saying you have 12 riders? Yeah, I have 12 riders. All, actually, now I have nine. The three guys who just took <laughs> their gone. shirts off are gone. <laughs> Ryan Sandberg leads it off for the Cubs. Six to two Mets. Sandberg has doubled and struck out. So he's one for two, and he taps to short. Ordonez. 
One out on one pitch. Have you had a chance to see Ordonez play a lot? No, I have not. He is terrific. I've he heard about him. He is really a, a terrific player. And uh, beyond his years, only 23 years old, a Cuban defector, defected back in 1993. Terrific so we were player. talking we were talking about the feeling of hitting a triple how you feel when you pull in the third is it is it a little bit of a disappointment or are you just no. excited because a triple is such a no. rare hit to a get a triple's an exciting uh, hit also and, and you have to have moderate speed you have to be a pretty good base runner and you have to find a gap most triples are right center left center so I think um, you rarely see a triple where the crowd's not on their feet. You do with the double. Uh -huh. A lot of people that don't stand up, singles, of course, uh, home runs, everybody's on their feet. But with the triple, they, it seems to be as exciting a hit as there is, even <laughs> even as exciting as a home run. I know Ralph would disagree with that. Since he is <laughs> well, I'm, I'm no authority on triples, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, but the one thing about it, Jerry, is that uh, the first thing you're excited about, and this will carry you all away, is the fact that you got a base hit. Nobody caught it. <laughs> Mark, that ball is hit pretty far. Grace hits it deep and to right. It's out of here. Gone. Well, there's a guy that led the league in doubles last year with over 50. At 51. Yeah, he'd take that home run over those doubles. I'll tell you, tell you that. He likes it twice as much, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's now a six to three net lead. The second Cub home run of the afternoon. First one, a two-run shot by Sammy Sosa. And he's the batter right now. That ball kept carrying and yeah. carrying and carrying. Yeah, I think he had a little help there with the with the wind. By the way, an absolutely perfect day. Isn't it beautiful? Out at the ballpark. Isn't it great? Here's great. that home run by Grace again, Jerry. Yeah, there's the pitch. You can almost see when, when the focus. Whenever I watch those highlights on ESPN and they just show the homers, you can almost see as they cut to the guy that he's settled. The eyes are always on the ball. Yeah. Rarely will the shoulder pull out and the guy hit a home run. Sosa lifts one foul territory near the stands in Bronia. Up on the tarp and it's a foul ball. Two and one to Sammy Sosa. This is one swing. Just Real great swing right here. And when you hit those balls like that, they come off your bat. They're light as a feather. Now he's an actor. You're going to have him on the show. He did a Bellucci film. Oh, really? Yeah, and, he, and uh, he, he's done some work. He was on uh, the uh, Jay uh, Leno show the other day in Chicago. Oh, really? Yeah. Jay Leno was in Chicago for the Tonight Show all of last week. Harry Carey was on. Of course, everybody a Harry Carey fan. Two and two to Sammy Sosa. You've been to Wrigley Field, have you? Oh, yeah. Huh? Many times. Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah. Tapped yeah. foul. Still two and two to Sammy Sosa. You have the lighter part of your schedule coming up, I would think, with the summer uh, reruns. Uh, yeah, but up. we're gonna we we write a lot to uh, get prepared for the new season. So we're going back in a couple of weeks and uh, start writing uh, new episodes for next year. Going back, meaning L.A. Yeah, probably. show is uh, shot in California. A lot of people think it's New York because it looks like New York. Uh huh. Uh huh. Themed around New York, of course. Three and two to Sammy Sosa. Ground ball is short. Ordonez again throws out Sosa. Two outs. You know, the great part about that show, Jerry, is you're the, everybody around you is so perfect for the uh, for the show. I mean, the, whoever put that together has got to be brilliant because everybody fits so, so nicely. That, that was kind of... It, it's not unlike a baseball team. When you get a group that works that well together, there's a lot of luck involved because you never can quite tell what the chemistry is going to be in advance. You just kind of hire the best person for each position, and if they gel, as this fella has gelled <laughs> many times on his own. <laughs> Outside to Luis Gonzalez. Were you chosen most likely now, to succeed? Now, how did these two guys become friends, you think? I have no idea. They have nothing in common. Nothing, right? in common. nothing <laughs> whatsoever They just see each other across a crowded room and just... Once you have found him, never let him go. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you were probably chosen most likely to succeed as a senior in Massapequa High, right? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually left high school six months early. 
By request? Or? Yeah, I requested to be let out. That's popped up. That's a big league pop. I guess it's a fly out now. And Bernard Gilkey makes the, the uh, final out of the fifth inning. And our, our sincere thanks to Jerry Seinfeld. Great job. Continued good luck with your magnificent work, Jerry. Thanks, Tim. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. you so and, much. And for one thing, by. Jerry, don't give up your day job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you don't either. <laughs> It is six to three, New York, middle of the fifth, coming up after this from your tri-state Toyota dealer. This television, you gotta love it. In one minute, we go from Jerry Seinfeld to Ralph Kiner. Oh, I'll tell you. Hey, wasn't that great? <laughs> Isn't that a funny, funny man? He is so talented. Woo. Well, Butch Husky and the Mets are looking from afar hoping his talent will take place in MVP in the International League last year and great spring this year in this ball game he has walked he also has singled and the Mets are leading by a score of six to three and a half swing there one ball one strike so you told Jerry Seinfeld not to give up his day jobs he said the same to you <laughs> that's right I, I know somebody told me don't ever fool with a guy as a comedian oh that's right no 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 don't, don't touch those guys if you've ever seen how they can work the room at places like catch a rousing star and some of the comedy clubs the improv here in New York you never ever you're always nice to comedians <laughs> <That's> always <right. laughs> And the next delivery to Husky is taken for a ball. It's two balls and two strikes. Husky came into this game hitting at 236 with two home runs, nine runs batted in. On the mound for the Cubs, Terry Adams, who came in the game in the fourth inning. We're in the bottom half of the fifth, and the fastball is missed, and Husky will walk back to the dugout. I mean, the awareness of Jerry Seinfeld when he came in, looking at both of us, <laughs> Checking out what we had on, kidding you about your baseball tie with your baseball tie. You standing up and, and not sitting down. And me standing up and not sitting down. I mean, my gosh. I mean, the, the awareness that he has. Extraordinary. Not bad on play-by-play -play either. No. He's, oh, he's a baseball man. He, he really is. Now the batter for the Mets, Ray Ordonez, and Ray pops it up on the third base side. The third baseman, Leo Gomez, has an easy play and makes it, and two men away. Hey, Ralph, with all of the problems that the Cubs have had with their starters, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see Terry Adams in the starting rotation by the time uh, we see the Cubs again. He's got the fastball for it. He throws hard. Good size as he retires his first two batters here in the fifth inning, and that'll bring up Pete Harnish. And Harnish, the, there he is. Well, that finally culminated into... A warning for the pitcher as Harness, who had hit the starting pitcher in the ball game, Kevin Foster, and now Harness, uh, the retaliation right here. We saw the first of this with Todd Huntley being knocked down on two strike pitch, and Harness swings over the top at the catcher, Scott Service, and now we got it. We got it going here at Shea Stadium. And it all started when Huntley was knocked down with a two-strike pitch. That was back in the first inning. And then when Harnish came up, the throw right there at him, he took that, and then the argument started, and now the fight seems to be calmed down at this point. In between, Harnish had hit the starting pitcher, Kevin Foster, with a pitch. out of the middle of that mess standing off to the side he and Scott Service got tied up together and Harnish took a swing at it and they've got another couple of players and the one guy who could really be hurt in this whole thing is Mark Grace who was the first one out there to try to break it up between Harnish and Service and Mark Grace to me looks more bewildered now and beaten up than anybody down there Well, Terry Adams was retaliating to the pitch that Harnish threw to Kevin Foster. Foster was hit, and now it's Pete Wilson and Mark Grace. And Dallas Green. Paul Wilson, I beg your pardon. 
I was probably thinking of the governor. He might be the only guy who could. He needs some help. Who could quell this thing? There's Mark Grace, who looks, whose left eye appears to be swollen. And off to the side, Ferguson Jenkins pushing Husky away. There are two big guys. I think he's just trying to uh, to ward things off. And now Jim Rickleman and Steve Swisher are at it. Steve Swisher, a coach, and now Todd Hunley wrestling with Frank Castillo. Oh, boy, this is nasty. This is nasty. You don't know who's getting the licks in. Oh, boy. Unbelievable. This is nasty. This is terrible. Just keeps starting up all over again, and now it's moved over there to the area by the stands, and it's still going on. And Husky right there in the middle of a group with a couple of players down on the ground on the grass. Rodney Myers, who was out of the game, is out of the dugout and in out of the training room. I've got to believe that there are going to be Mark Grace again is involved. And Mark Grace appears to me to have taken the brunt of the physical abuse that has been dished out. And it has been. from one of the umpires, Jim Riggleman, of course, the manager. It appeared to me that Riggleman and Swisher were at it. Steve Swisher, the bull, bullpen coach of the Mets. Now, this is one of the uglier fights that I've seen in a long time, Ralph. I remember a fight that Ed Lynch got into in Chicago when a pitch was thrown in tight to a cub batter and they had a brawl over there but nothing like this. There's Steve Swisher. Tony Muster, the third base coach for the Cubs. Now this is ugly, ugly, ugly. Well, we're going to see now that what was, the sanctions was, will be. That was Scott Bullet, number 10. To me, Mark Grace was involved in three, actually as one of the peacemakers. And often in these types of things, the peacemakers are the ones who become more hurt than anybody. Mark's not walking around right now. There's Kevin Foster. He started the game for the Cubs. And on an 0-2 pitch in the first inning, he came close to Todd Hundley. The Mets, I guess, thought that that was intentional. And the first time Foster was up, he was hit by a pitch from Pete Harnish. And here in the fifth inning, Terry Adams was the pitcher. He threw a ball behind Harnish. He was warned. And Harnish, everything appeared to be all right until Harnish poked around from home plate umpire Greg Bonet. He hit Scott Service, and then the violence ensued. And in Harnish's second at bat, where you might think the retaliation would be coming, he was in a situation where they could not throw at him because if they'd hit him, it would have loaded up the bases. So they got him in his right. third at bat. Right. So the sanctions will be told out by the umpires, and we'll see what will be the residue of all this. You know, Ralph, the one thing you don't hear, all the comments, all the side comments, all of the comments that keep the fight going, keep all of the things going, and I, I guess that's what you're saying. That's what the umpires are trying to de determine the, the wheat from the shaft in this uh, I wonder if Hines will be able to stay in the ballgame. Oh, no, he's gone. He's gone. Nah, he's, he's history. Be one and zero the count on a pinch hitter. I think he would be gone and a cast of uh, of thousands, as Cecil B. DeMille Mill would say. <laughs> yeah, they're liable to clear the bench. That's been done before. Umpires so. trying to uh, keep enough players available so the game can be completed.
say, Mark Grace looks hurt to me. He, he's not moving around right. You know, he's, he's holding his arms out. There he is walking in the Cub dugout. Now he's coughing. Not that that's an indication of anything, but just watching him for so many years, you just don't see him walk around like he's done. And again, uh, just from an observation standpoint, Grace appeared to be the peacemaker in the whole thing. He's a good-natured guy and uh, certainly big enough to get into any kind of a fight, but he uh, is basically a very pleasant type person. But as you said, Tim, it looked like he was trying to get everything calmed down and then he got involved and in self-defense had to retaliate. Butch Husky was trying to be restrained by Ferguson Jenkins. Uh, Leo Gomez now trying to be restrained from Frank Pulley by third base coach Tony Muser and first base coach Dan Radisson. That's Leo Gomez, the starting third baseman. Scott Service was the catcher, and he is the person against whom the first punch was landed by Pete Harnish, who went around the umpire to punch Scott Service. He got him with a hook and uh, up around the face, but you don't know what was said to Pete Harnish. John Franco trying to be restrained. That's third base umpire Bob Davidson talking with Franco. We will try to have the events for you right here, the events that led up to the altercation. In the first inning, runners on at first and second, an 0-2 count, and Hunley goes down from Kevin Foster. In my view, and I said it at the time, that was not a knockdown pitch. That's a pitcher pitching inside. In the second inning with Foster, the batter two out, nobody on. He was drilled in the left elbow by Pete Harnish. Evidently, the Mets thought that Foster was throwing at Hundley. And now with Harnish batting in this inning, the pitch inside, and it he didn't really make any effort to get out of the way of that ball. It wasn't really that far inside and didn't look like it was at him. And now Riggleman is coming out. And there is Harney's taking that right hook in there, and that started everything. So Harney's taking the right hook and hitting Scott Service. Two guys who were teammates in Houston. Scott Service was Pete Harness's catcher with the Houston Astros. And then Butch Husky, as we said, Butch weighs 245 pounds and is about 6'4". And he had about six guys trying to hold him back. And now the Cub dugout, unfortunately, some moronic fans think they've got to be involved in it. And how stupid can you get? So security's over the Cub dugout, and some Cub fan, some Cub players having words with fans who have no business in the world doing anything. So Dave Malicki is throwing, and he will be the pitcher in the top of the sixth inning. And Doug Jones warming for the Cubs. So both starting pitches appear to be out of the ball game. We'll see what they do with Scott Service and or the other players involved. There's Scott Service. We said Pete Harnish hit Service on the left side of the face. The pileups are where the injuries come. It's not really the personal altercation. I think baseball should do something about this, Ralph. Anybody who comes off the bench, automatic ejection and serious fan fine. That's where your injuries happen. If it's between the two guys, allow them to either battle it or separate them, eject them, and get rid of them, do whatever you want to. But in baseball, unlike hockey, the two provocateurs uh, rarely... Uh, I mean, once the once the initial action takes place, rarely are they ever seen again. That's and the right. other guys, and then the pylons, and you get right. down on the ground, and you get stepped on and uh, piled on, and that's when all your injuries take place. So the lineup cards are being changed, and the players that are being allowed to stay in the ball game will take their positions defensively, and the Mets 
We'll see what happens on their side. Dallas Green coming back off the bench to talk to the umpires once again. Jose Hernandez is in at third base. I think Leo Gomez is out of the game. Interestingly, Terry Adams is still out there, and the reason for that, I've got to believe, is he was already warned, and the confrontation was between the Cubs catcher, Scott Service, and Pete Harnish, the pitcher, so I think Dallas Green is going to have a pinch hitter now for Pete Harnish. I think Harnish is out of the ballgame. Yeah, oh, he's definitely yeah. gone. So he has to have a pinch hitter. And so is Scott Service, definitely gone. And Brian Dorsett is going to be the catcher. Got to wonder why Service was picked out, kicked out of the game. Uh, he got he got the punch thrown at him, and then yep. he retaliated after the punch. Yeah, but I mean, you're defending yourself then. Yeah, right. Of course, you never know what was said. That's Those true. are the things that we are not privy to. And the little guy with the sailor hat there is Josh Kawano, who is the equipment manager of the Cubs. He's been there since 1946. He's seen a lot of this. Uh, he hadn't seen too many better and more uh, vitriolic and angrier than, uh, than what we've just seen happen. It started up about four times, and they got to yeah. quiet it down, then yeah. started up again. The one I remember was when Pete Rose and Bud Harrelson got into the fight at second base. They finally got that calmed down. And then Pete and Pedro Bourbon got involved and blindsided Cleon Jones. That was in the 73 playoffs. And uh, that was an ugly mess. Well, rose, none of them are prettier, but some are uglier than others. Dorsett, the catcher. We mentioned Jose Hernandez. He will be in at third base. There'll be some juggling of the lineups. To our knowledge, Pete Harnish was the only player of the Mets kicked out of the game, but it appeared that John Franco was angry for whatever reason. I don't know whether Franco was run or not. Terry Adams, once again, was already warned, and that's an automatic fine of $50. And it's still fifty dollars. So Adams is allowed to still be in the ball game. And if he throws at any other batter, or they believe that he threw a, throws at another batter, he is automatically out of the ball game as well as the manager after the warning. Bobby Wine, who is keeping track of the lineup, now asking home plate umpire Greg Bonet. Brent Maine was shin guards on. We don't know. We don't know whether Todd Hundley was ejected or is gone because of an injury. This was a violent affair, however, and baseball has got to do something. And we've talked about it over the years. I guess you never talk about it again until it happens. happens. There's no reason to. But to me, the two combatants are the guys that are having the problems. In this instance, the catcher Scott's service and Mets starter Pete Harnish. Let them go at it. And anybody else ejected, fined, suspended, all of the things that are going to help curtail uh, this particular type of violence. And Ralph, I was involved in a ton of them. I know you mm -hmm. were. I've been on the bottom of the pile. I've been on the top of the pile. And they are not fun. And Mark Grace can attest to that. So, so Dave, a... Dave Malicki will be the hitter for Pete Harnish to count one ball and no strikes. So Malicki will take over the pitching duties, and that ball bounced foul down the left field side to count one ball and one strike. The first pitch of this inning was thrown, and it did not hit Pete Harnish. It was called a ball, and Harnish then got into the confrontation with Scott Service and threw a punch at Service, and that was the start of the whole thing. One ball, one strike to count, two men out. We're in the bottom half of the fifth inning. The Mets leading by a score of six to three, and we'll sort out all the information that we can sort out and get it to you as soon as we find out exactly what has taken place and who has been ejected from the ball game. One ball, two strikes to Dave Malicki. And that's strike three. So that will end the half inning. And after 
four and a half innings here at Shea Stadium. It's the Mets leading by a score of six to three. And here's a word from Pontiac. Malecki, the new pitcher for the Mets, taking over for Pete Harnish. His record stands at one win and two losses and no saves. Malecki will be appearing in his eighth ball game. He's had two game starts. And he will take over for Pete Harnish. Mets are leading in the ball game by a score of six to three. And also in the ball game as the catcher will be Brett Main as Randy, I should say Todd Huntley has been ejected from the ball game along with Pete Harnish. And that appears to be the only two Mets that have been ejected from the ball game. I'm not sure of that, but we'll check on it and hopefully yeah, we, we get don't an know, answer. We don't know about uh, John Franco. John was arguing vehemently with Bob Davidson, so uh, we'll have to check and see whether John was among the casualties. A lot of times in situations like this, you don't know until the next day whether you're hurt or not. Boy, isn't that the truth? Of all times for the grounds crew to come out with their Beach Boy outfits, it was about uh, five minutes after the fight subsided. Here they are trying to lend mirth to this 30,000 plus on hand. And, and let's face it, guys, you're not doing well. It's a bad room to work. <laughs> it's not a good room to work right now. <laughs> And the leadoff batter will be Jose Hernandez, who has taken over at third base for the Chicago Cubs. And Malecki with his first pitch, a called strike. And a good breaking ball, but out of the strike zone, one ball and one strike. Hernandez hitting 179. No home runs, three runs batted in. Started the first game that the Mets played in Wrigley Field against the Cubs and a wild swing and a miss it's one and two talk about an emotional roller coaster for us today I mean here we have the, the brilliance of Jerry Seinfeld in the booth and laughter and everything and of all things this violence on the heels of Jerry Seinfeld Seinfeld leaving Jerry probably catching it uh, now with his writers I'm uh, sure in the booth and still in the game big baseball fan but well, that was not pretty, what, uh, what happened in the bottom of the fifth. Here are the ejections from the game. Harnish nine Mine. guys. Swisher Franco is out. That could hurt the Mets later on in this ball game. Huntley out. Although the Mets are leading by a score of six to three. Service Gomez Wendell, who is a relief pitcher, and Scott Bullitt. So a swing and a miss as... Brian Dorsett bats for the first time, and Dorsett takes in the count one ball and one strike. So the Mets with two of their relievers out of there now, last minor and John Franco. So this is only the sixth inning, and if you end up with a tie game after nine innings, the Mets really working with a thin bullpen. This one hit deep, but it's foul down the left field line out of play. So Dorsett for the count of one and two. There's Jerry right there with his lady. He's explaining and it to her. He's explaining <laughs> the he's explaining the fight, right, Jerry? <laughs> One and two the count and another hard hit ball. This one over the head of Kent. It'll be at least a single fielded nicely by Gilkey. Dorsett makes a turn and holds there. So a runner on with one out. The Mets on top six to three and Ray Sanchez will be the batter. Sanchez in this game has flied the left and walked. He looks at the first delivery for a ball. It's one ball and no strikes. I was frustrated by four straight losses. The 
Chapman. The next pitch hit hard in the ground in the hole in the left field for a base hit. So now the tying run will be at the plate as the Cubs have put runners at first and second with one man out off of Dave Malecki, and that will be a tough situation for the right-hander coming in the ballgame in relief of Pete Harnish. It's going to be pitcher Terry Adams, and we'd have to believe he'll be bunting here. Got to be. This is odd. Of course, uh, you know, the Cubs have already used two pitchers in this game maybe they're thin as well but trailing by three and one out here in the sixth inning Terry Adams hitting for himself or bunting for himself in this particular instance he has been up only one time this year and he has no hits Mets looking for the sacrifice and he squares and takes the call strike so it's strike one Turk Wendell was one of the pitchers that was ejected. He is a fine reliever for the Cubs, so he's not available. So I guess that's, uh, that's why managers have to play a different game now for the next four innings. Well, Mets certainly could be hurt with Franco out of the ball game, and oddly enough, it was a big day for Franco before the game started. They bunt the first, and a play to third base is in time. So they get the force play as Bronia made a fine play charging on that ball. Had a little trouble deciding what to do or getting the ball out of the glove. But he got to play at third. Bronia way in. And watch Jeff Kent retreat. And Bronia really waiting for him to get back to receive the throw. Dorsett is not a fast runner. Reason for that delay was that Jeff Kent who was in on the play, had to retreat to third for the force out. That brings up Brian McCray. McCray in this game with a double and three at bats. Good breaking ball there by Malicki. You know, Ralph, another thing, Scott Bullitt, the uh, pinch hitter deluxe for the Cubs, he was also ejected, so they didn't have anybody. I mean, they did have someone to pinch hit, but in this situation, it would have be, been only to tie, and it could be another situation if Riggleman wanted to use that uh, that pinch hitter. Later on, when yeah. it might be a little more of a percentage move. Here you see a conference now at the mound as Maine talks it over with Malucky. For the Mets ejected from the game, Harnish, Miner, Swisher, Franco, and Huntley. For the Cubs, Service, Gomez, Wendell, and Bullock. Ray has struck out twice to go along with his double in the first inning. Mets leading six to three, and this ball hit deep to right center field. It's way back. Going back is Johnson. He is there, and he makes the catch. What a play by Lance Johnson, and that was the play of the game. Right on the warning track, one step against the wall, and the Mets get out of the inning. So no runs, two hits, two left, and the score at the end of five and a half innings. The Mets six and the Cubs three. And now here's a word from your tri-state Toyota dealer. Well, back here at Shea Stadium, a little bit of everything. Comedy, fights, you have it. Score the Mets six and the Cubs three. And this game is brought to you by Nobody Beats the Wiz. Total Home Entertainment Centers and by your Tri-State Toyota dealer. I love what you do for me. Well, Dallas Green and Dave Malicki have to love what Lance Johnson just did for them. What a play by Johnson. Here he is leading it off, and it happens so, so often. So often, yeah. and Johnson with the first pitch, and he fouls it back into the stands out of play. Johnson with a run battered in and a sack fly back in the third inning is 0 for 1 in this game. Officially also was walked intentionally. One strike to count. The Mets leading 6 to 3. Both sides with 7 hits. It will be Johnson, Vizcaino, and Gilkey as the first three batters here for the Mets, and that's a ball, and that's one ball and one strike. Terry Adams, the pitcher, and he gets a swinging strike, so it's one ball and two strikes. One and two. And it's strike three, so a good 
start for Adams in this inning. Came in the ball game in the fourth inning. Has given up one hit. And he will now pitch to Jose Vizcaino. Jose one for three with two strikeouts. Singled back in the first inning was a part of the Mets. Two runs in the bottom half of the first after the Cubs took the lead 2-0 in the top half of the first. The Mets got two in the third the lead 4-2. And two more to make it a 5-2 two, two ball game. And then the Cubs got one back. And that was in the fifth inning and it's now 6-3. The Mets over the Cubs. One ball, one strike. And Vizcaino looks outside. Jose hitting 336 for the year. One home run, 10 runs batted in. Ground ball to the first base side. It is knocked down by Mark Grace, and it'll be a base hit. Tough chance for Grace. Who won the gold glove in the National League last year? He has three gold gloves to his credit. This ball looked like it took a funky hop. It came up on him. Kind of slaps it toward the tarp. Took an unpredictable hop, even though it was high. I think Mark appeared to think it was going to stay down. Comes up, hits in the heel of the glove. A base hit for Biscaino. That brings up. Bernard Gilkey and he takes the first pitch for ball one. Gilkey has walked and scored. He also singled to drive in two runs in the second inning to put the Mets up four to two. And he has struck out. His strikeout came against Adams who came in the ball game to face him and that was his first batter. That's ball two. Two balls and no strikes. Yoki at 326. He leads the Mets and runs batted in with 31. He also has had seven home runs. Runner at first base. One man out. And the fastball fouled away. Adams, the third pitcher used by the Cubs. Kevin Foster started the ball game and was taken out in the third. And a balk is called and that puts Biscaino down to second base. And erases the foul ball by Gilkey. So a 2-0 count. And Gilkey trying to hit it down the left field side. Swings and misses. Two balls and one strike. You would think that a reliever who pitches from the stretch all the time that more balks would be called against them because most of the time they're pitching with nobody on. So they don't have to stop when nobody's on. That is true. Two and two now on the swing and miss. I've never really thought about that, but then they get a man on a man on base, and it's and it's like you continue the same motion that you had with nobody on when you didn't have to stop. But the rules are different, of course. Second ball called in this ball game, and that one on the inside corner strike three call. So Adams with his second strikeout in this inning. There again, you can see Dorsett sitting outside, crossing the plate. Usually catchers don't get those pitches for call strikes, even though they may be in the strike zone because you're moving the target so much. And that'll bring up Brett Main, who is batting in the fourth position in the batting order, replacing Todd Huntley, who is ejected from this game. And his first pitch, a call strike. strike the count to the left-hand batter backup catcher Brett Maine and that's a ball one ball and one strike Maine hitting 333 he's had seven hits and 21 at bats one home run four runs batted in Runner at second base, Jose Vizcaino. That's leading 6-3. And this one bounced to the second base side. Fielded by Sandberg. The throw to first retires the Mets. 
No runs, one hit, one left in the score at the end of six. The Mets six, the Cubs three, and now here's a word from Shell. The Mets on top by a score of six to three, and once again for the play-by-play, -play, Tim McCarver. All right, Ralph, Ryan Sandberg leads it off for the Cubs. It's six to three, Mets on top. This game marred in the bottom of the fifth inning. A bench clearing, bullpen clearing, clubhouse clearing brawl. And I mean it was nasty. As Sandberg, who doubled in the third, leads it off with the Mets on top by three. Slider in there for a strike, nothing in one to the Cubs second baseman. You know what was nasty about that fight? It was like the eye of a tornado or the eye of a hurricane. Whenever masses are in movement, as Sandberg grounds to third and Kent throws him out, one out here in the seventh. You know what I mean? If, 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 the, if the pile of bodies is stationary, usually no damage is done. But when you see the eye of the storm moving like that as it moved over near the Cub dugout and then it moved down the railing, that's when you know bodies are being torn, limbs are being torn. I'm not trying to be too uh, gross about this and, too, and depict it any way other than what it was. But uh, that's when your real injuries occurred, occur, and I would be surprised if injuries don't crop up tomorrow. You know, the other thing about that mess was the fact it started at home plate, as you say, and then moved over to yeah. another section, then moved over to another section, and then finally ended up right by the edge of the dugout. Nothing in one to Mark Grace, and he went too far. Nothing in two to Grace as we look at our National League scoreboard. Only one other game being played this afternoon Los Angeles over the Cardinals two to one in the eighth inning at St. Louis inside ball one one and two now to Grace and our Toyota American League scoreboard for the Red Sox all sorts of problems Blue Jays have tied that game in the night strike three call Second strikeout for Maliki, and now Grace arguing with Greg Bonet, the home plate umpire. Very unhappy with that call. It looked like it caught the inside part of the plate. It was a fastball. And Grace doesn't strike out that often. Backing up and very, very close. The other thing that's an interesting about this this game is the fact that Pete Harnish, who was on top in the game six to three, will not get credit for victory if the Mets hold on and no, he will. He went five innings. It was in the fifth. It, it was in the bottom of the fifth, though. So okay, he completed he got the it. top okay. five. Yeah, that's right. He was ahead by three then in the fifth. Mm -hmm. And uh, Terry Adams threw behind him, and it was ball one, and that's when. Uh, Scott service it looked like everything was as it counts one and one to Sammy Sosa two up two down here in the seventh but it looked like things were calmed down until uh, Jim Riggleman came out of the dugout to dispute the fact that Terry Adams was warned by home plate umpire Greg Bonet and that's when service and and Harnish were behind him. and then and Harnish slapped service in the left side of the face, and that's when both everything opened. Well, Bonet, after the pitch went by Harness, it missed him, it didn't hit him, it was inside, didn't look like it was really that tough a pitch. Immediately he came out in front of home plate and made the call on the pitcher. He certainly did, and he immediately made that call, and Sammy Sosa disagrees with Bonet. Still 6-3 to three, New York. Wild game at Shea. We're back after this from Sunoco. The count one and one to Rico, as Jerry Seinfeld said so correctly earlier. Rico only a double away from the cycle. He had a single in the first inning to drive in a run, a solo homer in the third, and he tripled in the fourth inning. High as Adams with the fastball, two balls and a strike. As we take a look at uh, Cycleville. Tough thing to do. In this century, three is the most anybody ever had. This one lifted to left. It is conceivable that Bronya will be up again. But in order to do that, the Mets would have to threaten. 
in effect they have five outs among eight players that have to be used up if Bronia is to get a shot at the cycle unless of course the Cubs tie it and the Mets bat in the bottom of the ninth inning Jeff Kent now he's 0 for 2 he walked in the fourth check swing punched foul nothing in one to Kent So Jeff Kent, his first hit of the day, hit number nine for the Mets. And that'll bring up Butch Husky, the right fielder. Right fielder, Butch Husky. This day has been a day riddled with emotions of all sorts. John Franco honored before the game, his 300th save. He had his high school baseball coach out. Nice base running by Jeff Kent as Dorsett allows the ball to go in the dirt. So a wild pitch by Terry Adams, allowing Kent to go to second. John Franco with his family here, with his wife, his two children. That set the scene for the game. And then Todd Hundley knocked down in the first inning on an 0-2 pitch. Pete Harnish hitting Kevin Foster, the Cubs starter, in the second. Terry Adams throwing behind Pete Harnish in the fifth inning. The bullpen's emptied. The clubhouse is emptied. Both benches emptied. And it was a nasty brawl. Nine players... Five from the Mets, four from the Cubs were ejected. Two balls and a strike to Butch Husky. Sandwiched in among all that activity, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Had no way of knowing this day would turn, up, turn out like this. This one hit deep to center. Back is McCray to make the play. And Kent moves to third, two outs. Butch Husky just missing a home run. Well, that's what you call programming. You have a little of everything. You have a little comedy. You have a little mystery. You have a little uh, action. We had all kinds of programming out here today on this channel. Well, it certainly has been a day of high drama, but not the type of drama that you... You like to see a, a, I mean, it was a vicious brawl between the Cubs and the Mets. Here's Ray Ordonez with Ken on at third and two outs, and Ordonez will be walked intentionally with Dave Malicki forced to hit since the Mets' bullpen is thin. And Jim Riggleman knowing that. He has the same problem. problems with the, the older managers a guy like Dallas Green who's seen many of those types of fights Dallas is 61 years old and sometimes an older manager forced to get into practice just to protect his players I'll never forget the time we were playing in Milwaukee Casey Stengel was the manager and we had a big fight start in the field Casey was right in the middle of it and uh, Next thing you know, Casey's on the ground. And Casey Stengel had grabbed Dennis Menke from behind and was holding him around the chest and arms. And Menke shrugged him off, and Casey went right down to the ground. And Menke said he looked down on the ground, and there was Casey Stengel. He didn't know who it was at first. He says, oh, my gosh, I killed the old man. Casey was 70, 70 years old. He was right in the middle of that fight. Nothing in one to Dave Malicki. Two outs, two on at the corners here in the seventh inning. Six to three, New York. Line down the right field line. Is it fair? No. It appeared 
we do not know for sure but it appeared that Jim Riggleman and Steve Swisher the Mets bullpen coach feared that they were having words and that was uh, one of the the restarts of the melee. I guess the full story will come out tomorrow when you hear what who said. This fastball low, one and two to Maliki. High with the slider, two and two now to Dave Maliki. Terry Adams, the third Cub pitcher of the day. Incidentally, Tim, the Knicks defeated the Bulls 102 to 99 today. Well, the Bulls up two games to one. Runner running. Ray Sanchez, the shortstop, makes the play and he throws out Maliki. It has been an eventful day here at Shea on our Miller line score. Six to three, New York, and we'll return after this message. Announced here at Shea that the Knicks beat the Bulls. Ralph talking about it last half inning, 102 to 99. So the Bulls up in that series, two games to one. Here at Shea Stadium in the fifth inning, that's where on top six to three, and it did not resemble a basketball game, maybe a hockey, hockey game. Hockey, more hockey. Right. <laughs> Next, by the way, won in overtime at the Garden. Beautiful day for baseball. Luis Gonzalez, the left fielder, leads it off. Luis won for two on the afternoon. Dave Malicki is third inning of work. Outside, ball one. We're back at you tomorrow at 1.30. Same two teams meet. Jim Bollinger for the Cubs and Mark Clark for the Mets. Rounded into right field. Base hit for Gonzalez, his second of the day. Hit number eight for Chicago. This is usually John Franco territory in these late innings, particularly the ninth, but John Franco ejected one of nine players and coaches ejected from the game. Five from the Mets, four from the Cubs. Jose Hernandez replacing Leo Gomez, who was ousted in the fifth inning. Slider, outside and low, ball one. One and nothing to Hernandez. from Vega Alta, Puerto Rico, turns 27 in mid-July. He gets jammed, lifts one into right center field. Gonzalez goes to third. So the Cubs continuing to come back at the Mets. Nine hits now for Chicago. They have runners at the corners and nobody out against Dave Malicki. of course do have Doug Henry in the bullpen they have Jerry DePoto in the bullpen Bob McDonald is available and Brian Dorsett the batter he singled in his only trip and the slider is outside one ball no strikes to Dorsett now Doug Henry is up and throwing for the Mets ground ball toward third Kent to Vizcaino, back to first double play in a big one. 
Gonzalez scores. It's now six to four, but the Mets will trade that any day of the week. Two outs. This is Taylor made for the New York Mets. Came with a good throw to Vizcaino. Perfect throw, as a matter of fact. And the completion of the double play. No run battered in. Whenever there's a double play, you do not get, get credit for the run battered in. Here's Ray Sanchez. He wanted to bunt. And he fouls it back. Normally, that would not be a good play with two out and nobody on. But since the Cubs are trailing by two, and Ozzie Timmons out in the on-deck circle, he'll be the pinch hitter for Terry Adams. If Sanchez can get aboard, pretty good play. Slider hit down the right field line foul. No balls, two strikes to Ray Sanchez, the Cubs shortstop. Side and low, ball one, one and two. High, ball two. So the count evens at two and two. Two outs, the Mets up by two here in the eighth. We'll do it again. Inside and it hit him. So Sanchez is hit by the pitch. The inside fastball, and that'll bring up Ozzie Timmons, the pinch hitter for Terry Adams, and here comes Greg Pavlik out to talk to Dave Malicki. That's the last thing that the Mets wanted to have happen there, to hit a batter. As you saw earlier, the knockdown pitches and what have you, causing the tremendously big ruckus here. And that puts a timer out of the plate when you hit that batter, and it brings up a pinch hitter. So you not only change the percentages of the ball game, you get that time run to the plate. Well, again, you don't know the history of how that uh, fight started. Again, Todd Hunley knocked down on an 0-2 pitch by Kevin Foster in the first inning. Pete Harnish hit. Kevin Foster in the second with two out and nobody on. And then Terry Adams threw a ball behind Pete in the fifth inning. Slider to Ozzie Timmons, who was 0 for 1 in last night's game. Slider misses, one ball, no strikes. Timmons with power. Boy, things have been going with the Cubs and Mets. Those home runs in the late innings really having a tremendous effect. Plus for the Cubs. One and one to Timmons. We mentioned power. Eight home runs last year in 171 at bats for Chicago. to be as fair as we can about the, the whole thing Ralph we mentioned earlier that we didn't think that Todd Hunley was being thrown at that at Foster when it happened was just coming inside and you you really never know anything until things come out over the next week but I think it does point out the sensitivity of coming inside in the big leagues today. as Timmons goes down on strikes on the slider away 
So Malecki pitching out of more trouble, even though the Cubs did score one. It's 6-4 to four in New York. We're back after this from your Tri-State Quality Ford dealer. Bottom of the eighth inning, a new pitcher, Doug Jones, in for the Cubs. Doug, a uh, veteran right-hander has been around, it seems, forever with a slow, slower, and slowest delivery. One and one in the year. He's had two saves and has blown four. Zimmerman averaged 5.29. 14 years in professional baseball, 11 years in the major leagues, and he'll be pitching to the top of the batting order. Number 27, Doug Jones. We take a look at the Nobody Beats a Wiz game summary. Lots happened. Nine players ejected in a cruel fifth inning brawl. Sammy Sosa, two run homer. Mark Grace, a solo shot. Rico Bronya with a single home run and triple and three RBIs. Pete Harnish will be the winner if Dave Malicki can hold on. Dave has worked three innings, giving up one run. And the guy who really saved the day for the time being, Lance Johnson, with that brilliant running catch off the bat of Brian McCray to end the seventh inning. Nothing in one to Lance. Hernandez near the dugout, and it hits right on top of the dugout. No balls and two strikes now to Lance Johnson. And earlier in the game, Bernard Gilkey making the nice running catch against Sammy Sosa. Two big defensive plays for the New York Mets. That was in the third inning. Saved at least a run in the third. Change, cued foul, still 0-2 to Johnson. To expand on what we were talking about without, you know, trying to treat this, uh, you know, the fight, the things leading up to the fight as, as fairly as we can. Popped up, door set off of the mask, back in the stands. Still 0-2 to Lance Johnson. You know, in both leagues now, Ralph, there is, an, in, in my judgment, an oversensitivity of pitching guys inside. Uh, it used to be that the game policed itself. Uh, guys took care of things like that. Now you have umpires who are understandably oversensitive. As Johnson rips one again, foul, still 0-2 to Lance. Players are oversensitive. Hitters are oversensitive. I think uh, pitchers not pitching inside is another reason the balls are shooting out of the ballpark at record pace. No question about that fact because if you pitch inside you take away the outside part of the plate from the batter because he stops moving in on the ball. He's worried one about being jammed and also secondly about being hit by the pitch. It has an effect on a lot of batters. Another one fouled off, still 0-2 to Lance Johnson. You couple that with an umpire not giving a hitter a high strike from the belt up and nobody coming inside, well, the only thing hitters have to do, they have to look out over the plate and down. So that box, the strike zone box, the imaginary box, shrinks. Just want to fly ball to center field. Brian McCray with the catch. One out here in the eighth inning. And when you don't change a hitter's eye level, I'll guarantee and brush him back and make him defensive of that pitch inside. Well, no wonder guys are hitting balls out of the ballpark. Everybody talks about how the ball's wrapped tighter, expansion pitching and everything. I think those two points have been overlooked. Well, you know, as well as I, if you can sit up there and take that full swing with full confidence, you really have a much better chance. Yep. Intimidation of baseball is a big, was a big part and has become a lesser part lately. Yeah, you take that intimidation factor away, and that's uh, one of the keys in a pitcher's arsenal. I'm a happy fan with a pretty good play off that first ball that Biscaino hit. It's a good play. He did it without a glove. He's <laughs> saying, why do they need gloves defensively? Change got him. You said it right. Doug Jones doesn't throw pitches. He conjugates it. <laughs> Slow, slower, and slowest. 
Just amazing what a pitcher can do with a lot of arm motion, a lot of uh, body motion. It makes it look like the ball is coming up there 90 miles an hour. You think the action is going to precede the ball at the same speed, and it never gets there. Fastball is over to Bernard Gilkey. Another good game by Bernard. He drove in two runs in the second. One for three with a run scored. Change inside. Ball one. One and one to Bernard Gilkey. Six to four Mets here in the eighth. Change on the corner. One ball, two strikes now to Bernard Gilkey. Got him with the breaking ball. So Gilkey down on strikes. Two strikeouts for Doug Jones, but the Mets have the lead six to four. We'll be back after this from Bell Atlantic. <laughs> Here at Shea Stadium, a game that has seen about everything. Those two young men. One fellow working on his swing with his glove on. You saw John Franco honored before the game. John's high school coach here. Some St. John's University representatives here. John's family. And then the brawl that happened in the fifth inning. And as we said earlier, sandwiched in between a very eventful two innings with Jerry Seinfeld. What a joy that was. A very, very bright man. One ball, no strikes to Brian McCray. the way one and one to Brian if Jerry could only have a successful TV series yeah but it just yeah. worked for him he's just hadn't been able to get a break poor guy <laughs> very talented guy but can't catch a break <laughs> fly ball left field slicing foul go ball and two strikes to Brian McRae to lead off the ninth inning. The Mets up by two. You know, Tim, you wonder where they come up with new ideas all the time as you see Henry McDonald throwing in the bullpen for the New York Mets. Doug Henry and Bob McDonald. For example, going back to the early days of television, you had uh, the Desi and Lucy show with a premise there. And then, of course, uh, Gleason and his great show, another premise. And they keep changing around Archie Bunker and his show and then another theory another idea they just keep coming up with them keeping up with societal changes two and two to Brian McCray full count now to the Cubs center fielder Mets up by two but the top of the order for Chicago here in the ninth Line drive, base hit, left field. So McCray is aboard. And that'll bring up Ryan Sandberg. Second baseman, Ryan Sandberg. Now Dallas Green has Bob McDonald up for the left-handed hitting grace. So I would think that unless this is a double play ball, that Bob McDonald would be the pitcher for one batter, Mark Grace, and then Doug Henry would come in to pitch to Sosa at all. Sandberg, one for four. He has grounded out twice, doubled and struck out. And the slider in there. like Mark Grace is checking some numbers on Bob McDonald. Foul tip by Sandberg. He's in the hole. No balls, two strikes. We're in the ninth inning, six to four New York, but the Cubs with one man on and nobody out. Side and low. Ball one. One and two.
wind starting to kick up here at Shea. The Sandberg hits one foul down the right field line. If this were the eighth inning, I'd say Bronya should hold the runner on at first. He's told that by the bench, by the way. You do have speed on at first, but it's the ninth inning. And to me, the only run that's important is Sandberg. I think you play Bronya back in his position here. Nice play by Brent Main. Two and two now to Sandberg. Now you don't mind at all if that run scores at first base. You got to keep that time run, which is at the plate right now, off of second base. Actually, off of first if you can do it, but you don't want an extra base hitter. Well, the count three balls, two strikes now to Sandberg. And he had him at a two strike count. Now the advantage is swung away from the pitcher. Malicki had the count. No balls and two strikes, and he loses Sandberg. And that'll bring up Mark Grace, and he's not going to face Dave Malicki. He's going to face the left-hander, Bob McDonald. So Dave Malicki came in in the sixth inning. He gave up one run in his three-plus innings works of work. But the Cubs with two on, nobody out here in the ninth. The Mets up by a precarious two. We'll be back after this from Cadillac. Ninth, thunder clouds in the distance. There were a few thunder boomers here in the fifth inning. Nine of them were ejected. Nine players ejected in this ballgame. And a good crowd on hand and a little of everything in this ball game. The new pitcher for the Mets is Bob McDonald. He's 0-1 with no saves. This will be his 13th appearances. 13th appearance. The wind is picking up here. There is a threat of rain in the offing. And a tough hitter, Mark Grace, the batter, with a time run at first base. Grace is not a punter in this situation. He is a hitter. On deck, Sammy Sosa. It's the ninth inning. He had two ninth inning homers against the Mets last weekend in Chicago. Grace hits it to right field. In is Husky to make the play, and it wasn't deep enough to advance at least one runner. So I think Bob McDonald did his job. No way he's pitching to Sosa with Doug Henry warm in the bullpen, and here comes Dallas. Well, he has one pitch. He gets a big, big out, and that's what Dallas had him for. And now he'll go to the right-hander to go against Sosa. And behind Sosa is a left-hand batter. So a hard day's work, one pitch, but he got the job done, and that's what Dallas Green wanted. He got the out. So there's one out now. Two on, still six to four. We'll be back once again after this from Cadillac. Now it's in the hands of Doug Henry, who comes in the ball game with a record of one win and one loss. He has two saves. He does have a high ERA, 5.30. This will be his 15th ball game. And keep in mind, John Franco is not available. He was involved in the fight. He was ejected from the ball game, so the Mets cannot go to their closer, who was honored here before the ball game for winning 300 games, or actually saving 300 games. No left-handed pitcher had ever done that. John with his 301st save last night. Sammy Sosa. The Mets have seen this story before. They saw it twice last weekend and won a different ending. There goes McCray. Fastball is high, and the throw is late. And how do you walk Sosa? No. I wouldn't. I wouldn't either, but that, that's the question is going to be coming up. You got the time run at second base on the double steal, and Sosa, of course, is the winning run. On the first pitch, Brian McCray took off. Sandberg followed. 
The fastball was high. One and nothing to Sosa. Slider is low. Two balls and no strike. Oh, that's some daring play right there. If it doesn't work, you practically take yourself out of the ball game. Well, it worked, unfortunately, for the Mets. 2-0 to Sosa. Tap foul. That was the slider. You don't walk Sosa, but you certainly don't give in to him. On deck is Luis Gonzalez, who is two for three on the afternoon. I'd think about walking Gonzalez before I would Sosa to get to him. You know what I mean? I agree with that. Got her Jose Hernandez behind him hitting about 190. High ball three. Three and one to Sosa. And just to remind you, these are the players ejected from that fifth inning brawl. Five for the Mets, four for the Cubs. One out, two on. The Mets up by two. A double steal pulled off by the Cubs. It really put the Mets in a precarious situation. That first pitch was a strike, Ralph, and it was, it was up on the board as a ball. And that's what Riggleman's arguing about. He's saying the first pitch was a ball. He said you called it a ball. That's what I thought he called it. I actually thought it was a 3-1 count then instead of a 2-2 count, and Riggleman thought the same thing. And the board had it that way. And yeah, right, and Riggleman went on the board, yeah. and, I, and I fell for the same trick. So that first pitch, evidently the pitch on which McCray and Sandberg stole, was a strike. Here's, Here's a, the first pitch again. Go let's ahead, look at it again. The first pitch to Sosa, Doug Henry the pitcher, and it was a strike call. But you know what happens? Greg Bonet gives you such a late call. That's right. That you don't see the arm go up, and that's what happened there. And they're going to do exactly what you talked about. They're going to walk race and take on the other guy. So Sosa's out of there. I mean, and, Gonzalez. And Gonzalez will be walked, and they will pitch to Jose Hernandez. First strikeout for Doug Henry. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the first pitch was no call. So it's it's my fault Third that I called it a ball, Hernandez. but it's Bonet's fault that he didn't call it anything. Uh, he, he doesn't. He gives you that <laughs> late arm motion, and it can decoy you right out of it. Yep. What a ball game. So Gonzalez is intentionally walked. The base is loaded two outs now, and Jose Hernandez, the batter. He singled his last time up. He has also struck out. Slider in there. Strike one. with no appeal. It's one and one to Hernandez. Well, the appeal doesn't cost you anything. You should always try. Slider on the corner right there. One ball, two strikes. Well, here's that last pitch. He didn't swing. That was a pitch before the last pitch. Didn't swing. The other one was a strike. One and two. Slider foul back. Fans on their feet here at Shea. 23,000. 237 on hand. They have seen about as much as you want to see in a nine-inning game. It's a 6-6 ball game as Hernandez comes through. Well, 
Well, the Cubs have done it to the Mets again in the ninth inning in their last chance. They have come back to get in the ball game. They have tied it up. They have a chance to go ahead. Two strike count in the situation. This looks like a perfect pitch. A low outside slider was outstanding as far as location. And Hernandez reaches out and punches it into the area in left center field to tie up the ball game at six. Ryan Dorsett, the batter, grounded into a double play his last at bat. 6-6 six, six game, and the fastball is low. Cubs with runners at the corners, two outs. Dorsett is one for two since entering the game when Scott Service was ejected in the fifth inning. One and nothing to Dorsett. Slider foul back, one and one to Brian Dorsett. That closes the book on Dave Malicki. And Pete Harnish. Pass ball is low. Two balls and one strike. Pete with a no decision today. He was uh, still alive until that hit by Hernandez. Pete would have been the winner if Henry could have gotten Hernandez out but Hernandez with a single to center scoring two and the slider foul back two and two now to Dorsett keep in mind both bullpens are very thin the Mets had two of their bullpenners Glass Miner and John Franco ejected Turk Wendell of the Cubs ejected as Bob Patterson warms Two and two to Brian Dorsett. Brent Main giving signs to the middle infielders should Hernandez run. Looks like the infielders are back enough to where they won't throw through if Hernandez tries to steal. Two and two to Dorsett. Fastball right side. Vizcaino throws out Dorsett, but the Cubs remarkably tie it. It is six to six, and we're back after this from what else? The New York State Lottery. <laughs> well, the, uh, that fellow had that bag in, uh, in front of his face. I was going to say the game is not that bad yet. <laughs> Miller six-pack bag day today. Fellow doing his uh, imitation of the unknown comic. Don't forget, fans, that uh, tomorrow is Mother's Day and women 15 and over at the 140 game against the Cubs will receive a Mother's Day tote bag. One ball, no strikes to, to Brent Main, leading off the ninth of a 6 6 ball game. And papers flying down around Shea. Brent Main had called time out. Did he get it from the umpire? Yeah, he did. Ball two. Two balls and no strikes. Well, I guess all children of mothers consider their mothers beautiful. I'll tell you, on the eve of Mother's Day, this is an ugly game. Two balls, no strikes to Brent Maine. Ugly in a lot of ways. Not necessarily the play. Been some good defensive plays, particularly by the Mets, Lance Johnson, Bernard Gilkey. Good hitting. But an ugly brawl marring this game in the fifth inning. Nine players ejected. Two balls and one strike to Brent Main. Fastball outside. Three balls and one strike.
Brent 0 for 1 since replacing Hundley in the sixth. Rico Brogna on deck. Fastball for a strike. Three and two now to Brent Maine. Keep in mind, Rico Brogna only needs a double for the cycle. Ground ball right side. Mark Grace takes it himself. One out. Well, Tim, you said he might have another chance to do it, and here it is, but certainly the hard way for the New York Mets with the Cubs going two runs to take it into the bottom of the ninth inning. Rico singled in the first inning. Let off the fourth, make that let off the third with his third home run of the year, and then he tripled in the fourth, so he's three for four. Outside to Bronia. Home run coming to left field earlier in the game. Change, fouled away. It's amazing how many guys Doug Jones jams. And they wait. Yeah, they wait and wait and wait, and that 76 mile an hour fastball eats them up. One and one to Rico Bronia. Right field and deep. Sosa over near the track and back, and this ball is gone. Home run, Rico Bronia, and the Mets win it seven to six. Unbelievable. of the day and his fourth of the year wins it for the Mets. Look at Sosa tracking this ball. A stutter step. A stutter step. To the fence. The jump. Gone. Mets win it 7-6 to six on Rico Brunia's homer and we'll be right back after this from Miller Brewing. Brother. Brother. 